Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and a big welcome uh, to all our attendees this afternoon. Uh, my name is Chris Yelland, the Managing Director at EE Business Intelligence, and I will be your host and moderator today, signing in from Johannesburg. A big welcome also uh, to the uh, European Union Ambassador to South Africa, Dr. Rina Kionka, and to the Minister of Higher Education, the Honorable Mr. Blade Nzamandi. And welcome to all our presenters this afternoon, all of whom will be introduced to you in due course. And of course, a big welcome to you, the attendees today, for your interest and participation. We have over 1,600 delegates registered to attend this webinar on renewable hydrogen and green power fuel opportunities for South Africa. And to hear what Ambassador Kionka, Minister Nzamendi, and the presenters have to say on the subject. May I express a big thanks to Ambassador Kionka and Minister Nzamendi for honoring us with their insights. And also a big thanks to our co-hosts, the European Union delegation to South Africa. I am truly grateful for your support and the work that you've done to promote and highlight the green power fuel opportunities arising in South Africa. May I also acknowledge and thank the EU delegation to South Africa, the Port of Rotterdam, Nedbank, Air Liquid, and Enetrag for your most valued sponsorship of this webinar. And finally, may I thank the European Union South Africa Partners for Growth Program for facilitating the report on power fuels and green hydrogen that is researched, written, and presented today by Thomas Ruiz and Dr. Jared Wright of the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research, the CSIR of South Africa. All persons that registered to attend the webinar today will receive a copy of this important document that is being launched publicly here. Please do note that this webinar is being recorded and a link to view the webinar will be made available publicly afterwards. While the presentations are in progress, uh, please do send your questions on the Q&A text facility. We have set aside half an hour after the presentations for our expert presenters to answer just some of your questions. Now, we're going to do a little bit of a change in the program, uh, and I would like to tell you about it. Unfortunately, Minister Nzamandi has been delayed by 15 to 20 minutes, and uh, uh, Ambassador uh, Irina Kionke was going to introduce him first. But uh, what we're going to do now uh, is change the order a little bit and uh, start off uh, with uh, Dr. Rebecca Masiramule uh, to introduce uh, the uh, report and the two presenters from the CSIR uh, who will present first. And then um, uh, we'll then follow that up afterwards uh, with the introduction by uh, Ambassador Kionke of the, the minister. So firstly, let me uh, say a few words about uh, Dr. Uh, Rebecca Masiramule. Uh, Dr. Rebecca Masiramule has a Bachelor of Science degree from Rochester University in the USA and a PhD in Applied Mathematics. And she worked at the CSIR and the Department of Energy in South Africa before being appointed Chief Director, Hydrogen and Energy at the Department of Science and Innovation in 2015. So she's eminently qualified to introduce to us this report and this work done by the CSIR, commissioned by the EU South Africa Partners for Growth. And I'd like to now hand over to Dr. Rebecca uh, to say a few words. Over to you. Um, good afternoon. Um, I'd like to first say thank you so much for the opportunity to present um, um, the introduction to the report um, and then just acknowledging the ambassador as well as the minister in his absence, all protocol observed. Um, you know, say hydrogen is, is touted as a game changer, the most abundant element on earth after oxygen, a flexible energy carrier. And now hydrogen is being, you know, brought forward as an enabler of abatement in hard to abate sectors in South Africa. 
But we'll say that in order for hydrogen economy to unfold, it's critical that we have evidence-based policy. And for me, this report is, is seen as an opportunity for South Africa to have an independent view on the opportunities for green power fuels and, and green hydrogen in South Africa. So I would, I would recommend that we use it as a resource that is intended to be used. And thank you so much for the opportunity um, to present it today. Um, and then before I go, I'd like to give you an introduction to the two gentlemen who are responsible for writing the report and will be presenting today. So first we have Thomas Roos. He's a senior researcher at the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research um, in the Energy Center. His career spans 27 years at CSR and he's been predominantly focused on thermodynamics, heat transfer, turbo machinery and energy. His current interests lie in providing evidence-based economic motivation for the development of South African renewable hydrogen export market. And secondly, you know, we have Dr. Jared Wright. He's a principal researcher at the CSIR Energy Center in Pretoria, and he has a power sector consulting experience in 11 African countries. Um, he's involved in power and energy system operations and planning, looking at sector coupling, issues of system stability, um, as well as looking at forecasting the resources, both renewables, network planning, storage, and enabling market arrangements. He's also appointed as a, minute, as a commissioner of the National Planning Commission by the President of South Africa for the period of 2015 to 2020. So if you look at the background of our authors, we, they're well, um, you, you have a really good group that's here to give you, a, a, I think, a strategic view as to what we can do for South Africa. Thank you. Thomas, would you like to come forward and make your presentation on behalf of the CSIR? Thank you. If you can switch your mic on, thank you. Thank very you. Much. <laughs> thank you very much for those uh, uh, kind words, um, uh, Dr. Masaru Mule and, and Chris. Um, I would like to just confirm that you can see my screen. We can see you, Thomas, uh, and if you can share your screen, uh, that'll be great. Get the screen, okay, understood. Yes, we can see it. If you can kindly maximize it uh, into, yeah, screen view. Of course. That's it, uh, that's it, Thomas. Fantastic. All right, um, thank you very much again. Um, I would like to acknowledge my um, uh, co-author, um, uh, Jared Wright. I myself will be uh, presenting the, the, the presentation in order for, uh, to maintain uh, rhythm and time. I'd like to start with a spoiler alert. As you can see at the very top of the presentation, we believe that South Africa can indeed produce renewable hydrogen competitively with other coastal countries. And this can give rise to a new industry, supplying new export and domestic markets. The presentation is based on a report commissioned by the EU delegation, as mentioned. There are six sections in the report, and I'm only going to cover four today. The international context, the economics of power fuels production, the industry is likely to, be, uh, to benefit from power fuels, and the barriers to power fuels. So what are power fuels? They are all products based on hydrogen produced from the electrolysis of water using renewable electricity. On this image, you see a number of different products, hydrogen, a number of hydrocarbons, and ammonia. Power fuels are also known as e-fuels, power to liquids, power to gas, or the catch-all power to X. They are all renewable synthetic fuels, either liquid or gas, um, and they're alternative to fossil fuels. They are necessary to meet climate goals in hard to abate sectors. Now, you may ask, why now after so many false starts in hydrogen or apparent false starts? And the answer I'd like to submit is a convergence of several trends. The first, the climate regulatory and financing pressure is certainly accelerating. The Paris Agreement, where um, all nations agreed to commit to limiting um, uh, global warming to below two degrees 
before pre-industrial era and hopefully below 1.5 degrees. The European Green Deal um, coming fairly soonly after that, uh, 2020, essentially with a goal of um, limiting the EU to being climate neutral by 2050. Finance activism is an interesting issue in the sense that it um, represents the disinvestment from fossil forces, particularly coal. And this is also driving things forward. Sorry, I just want to put the camera on. The second is economics, the declining costs of renewable electricity. Now, renewable electricity has been competitive in areas with good renewable resources since about 2014. And South Africa is no different to this. In 2015, the final round of the REIPP, new PV and new wind was in the order of 40% cheaper than new coal, nuclear, or gas-fired combined cycle gas turbines. Now, the first step in decarbonization, wherever, is to attempt to use direct electrification with renewable electricity. Now, the hard to abate sectors are those areas where that is difficult or even impossible. And power fuels provides attractive solutions to that. There are two broad regions, heavy duty, long distance transport, and four particular industries. In transport, heavy duty, long distance trucks and buses, currently diesel powered, Electric, electric options are difficult when they are battery-based in terms of range and power density. Hydrogen-powered fuel cells around, allows a way around that. In aviation, the industry standard is kerosene powering high bypass ratio turbofan engines. That power-to-weight ratio is difficult to um, replace with other options. So one emerging consensus is to make use of synthetic fuel and keep the same gas turbine engine, but have the fuel based on captured CO2 and green hydrogen. Shipping is based on heavy fuel oil combustion. Here, the emerging consensus is to make use of green ammonia. You'll notice rail in my slide has got an asterisk, and that's because it's a special case. It is not a classic hard to abate sector because it is possible to electrify rail transport, but not all rail lines are electrified and they're expensive to retrofit. In terms of industry, iron for steelworks is particularly difficult. Essentially, iron oxide needs to be reduced to iron by exposing it to carbon monoxide obtained by the incomplete com uh, combustion of coking coal. The carbon monoxide strips the oxygen from the iron, iron oxide relieving the iron. A PTX pathway approach to replace this is to make use of green hydrogen instead. Cement is particularly challenging in the sense because one, it, um, the chemical reaction required to move calcium carbonate into calcium oxide inevitably results in CO2 emissions. And secondly, this must be done at temperature, which is obtained by the combustion of fossil fuels. The PTX option to this is to simply capture the CO2 that is emitted and use that as a feedstock where carbon-based products are a, de a definite requirement and to move away from ancient carbon fossil feedstocks. Ammonia is made with hydrogen obtained from the steam reforming of methane. By replacing that with green hydrogen, the carbon emission then becomes redundant. Finally, plastics are based on ethylene. Ethylene is a hydrocarbon. That hydrocarbon is currently exclusively obtained from fossil sources, oil, natural gas. If the carbon is instead obtained from the capture of CO2 from hard to abate sectors and the hydrogen obtained by electrolysis, then the carbon input, uh, the carbon impact of current plastics production is then abated. The final reason is the extraordinary public policy support for the import of bulk power fuels. I'd like to start with Japan, which from 2030 plans to import the order of 300,000 tons of hydrogen per year at a target price of three US dollars per kilogram. This will grow to between one and one and a half million tons per year by 2050. The Japanese plan to have a switch 
in 2040 to only carbon-free hydrogen. The European Union, in turn, their Renewable Energy Directive number two specifies that 14% of transport energy must be of renewable origin. The European Green Deal has ambition for decarbonizing steel and transport. And the hydrogen strategy of the European Union envisages 40 gigawatts of electrolyzer capacity inside the EU and a foot, further 40 gigawatts installed in what they call Europe's neighborhood to further supply the EU with green hydrogen. The German national hydrogen strategy states that it alone requires in the order of three megatons per year by 2030. But only some 420,000 tons can be produced in country. The rest will have to be imported from other countries in the EU or renewable energy rich partner countries. South Africa is a renewable energy rich partner country which places us in good stead. The Netherlands has severe space constraints, so land-based renewable generation is problematic. The Netherlands plans to remain essentially within the, 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 the green hydrogen space to retain the status of their ports, which are key to moving large amounts of chemical energy into Northwest Europe. While that moves away from carbon, they would like to maintain that hub status through renewable hydrogen. The Netherlands also plans sustainable aviation blending targets with a goal of 14% by 2030 and a full 100% by 2050. This is likely to be essentially um, uh, synthetic kerosene because biofuels have got certain volume limitations. So where does that leave us? Well, South Africa's got a great market opportunity. Um, we've seen that both Europe and Japan have committed to bulk import of uh, PTX hydrogen. And because of South Africa's phenomenal solar resource and amazingly good wind resource, together, bulk hydrogen can be produced competitively compared to other coastal countries. This can be seen from this map from the International Energy Agency report to the G20 meeting in Tokyo. CSR has done its own independent analysis, but in terms of time, we won't go into um, uh, the details of, of that work, but it supports this particular picture. So, in order to produce hydrogen, one needs to electrolyze water. But South Africa is a water stressed country. So sustainability constraints may mandate that water can't be diverted from communities, agriculture, or the environment. Therefore, seawater desalination is more sustainable. The cost implications are not as um, severe as one would um, imagine from the first. The desalination component will be in the order of two US cents per kilogram of hydrogen produced, which is less than 1% of the target hydrogen price. Now for export, we want to produce at the lowest possible cost so that we can compete with other countries. This requires that the hydrogen is produced at or near the port of shipment, thereby eliminating all land-based transport costs. And the feedstock, of course, being desalinated seawater. This gives rise to an interesting proposition. And our recommendation is that as part of the social license to operate, that the desalination plants supplying electrolyzer plants be oversized by 300%. And that the extra capex costs be built into the hydrogen price, which is then carried by the customers. And that hydrogen price, as you can see, will not be greatly affected. So the capital repayment costs will be paid for by the hydrogen business and during drought, we operate the desalination plants at full capacity. The local utility is then able to buy the excess water at only the electricity component price. And in times of good rains and full dams, operate the desalination plant at only 30% capacity supplying the electrolyzer plant. Our recommendations for export are Soldana Bay to supply the exports to Europe. It is South Africa's deepest port and it's on the western seaboard. It can accommodate vessels of 21 meter draft. It's in a good solar and wind resource region. And it's in the berg catchment, which as you can see from the image below, is going to be subjected to severe water stress in the future. So desalination assistance would be welcome there. The port of Kucha is our recommendation for exports to Japan and South Korea. It's an underutilized deep water port, unlike Durban, which is rather busy. And so therefore we don't recommend Durban as an export port for the Far East. 
Kucha can accommodate vessels of 14 meter draft. It's an area of good wind, wind resources, again, unlike Durban. It may connect to good solar regions not terribly far away through the national electricity grid. It's in the fish to Kaskama region, which will be subjected to moderate water stress. So how does one transport hydrogen? Let's discuss some of the feasible hydrogen carrier options. According to our work, we believe that South Africa can produce and deliver hydrogen to Japan, and therefore the EU, because it's closer, at a cost below three US dollars per kilogram of hydrogen between 2030, which is the Japanese bulk shipping date, and 2040, which is Japan's carbon-free date, which means we can deliver it to Japan earlier than their carbon-free requirement. It can be shipped most economically as ammonia in liquid organic hydrogen carrier, which is a bit like a, 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 a liquid chemical sponge, which can carry up to 6% by mass of hydrogen at atmospheric pressure and room temperature requiring no special handling, or as methanol, unless of course the CO2 for the methanol is obtained by direct air capture, in which case it will be expensive. We must stress that methanol is not Japan's preferred hydrogen carrier. We do not recommend export as compressed gas or cryogenic liquid, as that will be um, economically penalizing. An interesting variant is as steel. One application for green steel is the manufacture of direct reduction iron. Now, instead of exporting the hydrogen to produce the steel in the EU, the steel could be shipped directly from Saldana. Saldana Steel is a mothballed steel plant at the port. Its operations were killed by cheap Chinese imports. By repurposing it for DRI steel for export, it will face less market pressure as it will attract higher prices than conventional steel. And eventually such steel will be the only steel to be unaffected by future EU border adjustment taxes. So what are the barriers to power fuels? What must change in order for PTX to succeed in South Africa? Firstly, legal or regulatory areas. There is a sustainability requirement imposed by the German national hydrogen strategy that PTX for export must not increase fossil fuel use or impede renewable energy in the exporting countries. Therefore, it is obvious that a greater renewable energy allocation or separate allocation is required to create bulk or export PTX. The existing allocations under the IRP are for decarbonizing the grid and for energy security. Diverting any of that allocation will violate the German requirement. The renewable energy infrastructure licensing regime under the IRP is also not geared for large renewable volumes for bulk hydrogen production and export, as that's going to be largely own use or wheels through the grid. So that requires a bit of work. A further area of regulatory work and adjustment is aviation and maritime PTX fuel. It's more expensive than the conventional fuel, and its use in international airspace and waters falls outside uh, regular national and regional jurisdictions. That requires a global policy framework. My apologies. Market support is required. PTX products cost more than fossil products, at least for now, and the PTX products from earlier plants will cost more than those from later plants, much less renewable electricity, as subsequent plants produce cheaper than earlier plants. This requires support instruments, incentives, carbon penalties, long-term offtake agreements, and the like. CO2 pipelines are gonna be needed in the end because bulk PTX hydrocarbons, which is for plastics and aviation fuel, which in the end is gonna be the only um, a carbon based product, which is going to be feasible and allowable under sustainable environment. The manufacture of such hydrocarbons at Petro SA and Sassel will require a separate CO2 supply source because they cannot rely on their own declining process emissions as they progressively clean. Now, most hard to abate carbon dioxide in South Africa is emitted inland. 15 of the 20 cement plants are inland and steelworks are inland. CO2 pipelines are a known entity. 2,500 odd kilometers of it in the US moving 50 million tons of CO2 per year. Pipelines can then similarly deliver CO2 to Sassel and from there a single pipeline to Petroset. 
Finally, the human resource and technical capability, we don't envisage there to be an obstacle. There are chemical engineering expertise pockets in various industrial sectors in South Africa. And from the REI P experience, international companies invested in the local market, created supply chains and developed human capital. The same will be true for PTX and hydrogen product. So finally, my last slide, where are the opportunities? What are the industries likely to benefit from PTX? Well, green hydrogen is gonna need green electricity. So therefore the renewable power developers are certainly going to have a good opportunity. Mining is already seeing hydrogen. Anglo, the mine truck, bulldozer and locomotive that are being developed and implants a forklift and underground, the use of hydrogen in fuel cell apparatus can replace diesel, therefore replacing the carcinogenic diesel emissions and the burden that places on the ventilation systems. Banks and investment houses will have uh, investment opportunities. Gas handling companies will speak later in this webinar. Urban bus transport gives an opportunity for metros to decarbonize. And unlike private vehicle ownership, the um, bus routes are circular or repeating which allow few and centralized hydrogen uh, refueling stations. Long distance trucking opportunity is in the hydrogen valley from Lapopo to Durban, which is in, uh, envisaged by Angie and various other partners with refueling stations along the, along the way. The opportunities for electrolyzer and fuel cell companies, the ports, as I mentioned, railways. City of Cape Town is considering fuel cell locos to counteract the effect of perennial and persistent cable theft. PTX cargo transport is also possible by Transnet freight rail on the trains returning from delivering ore and product at the ports. Sishan Saldana line returns empty, as does the manganese line that terminates in um, Port Elizabeth, or the coal trips that go towards um, Richards Bay. In steel making, I've spoken about Saldana steel, the Funabel Park um, steelworks, carbon emission can be captured and reused for PTX. Cement, I've mentioned the, um, the inland coastal works, the PT uh, uh, carbon can be captured to produce methanol that can be sold into the PTX market or could be used as a carbon neutral calcination, calcination fuel directly for the, um, uh, uh, the cement plants. So it becomes a circular economy, so to speak. For oil refineries, green hydrogen allows sulfur de uh, diesel desulfurization to be done in a cleaner way. And methanol can be used as an additional feedstock, which can dilute the ancient carbon fraction in the creation of aviation fuel. Finally, this brings us to the Fisher Trops refineries. Petro SA, as you know, is facing a difficult position. Their um, feedstock supplies are declining, leaning them to operate at significantly below capacity. Significantly repurposing their business model towards supplying CCU PTX aviation fuel to Europe based on captured CO2 and electrolytic hydrogen can completely give them a new business model and decouple them from supply constraints. Cecil places, faces a slightly more difficult situation in the fact that they are inland and the pipelines run the wrong way. So only in-country offtake is possible at present. This requires development of their PTX business model. Well, Liz, can you bring your presentation to an end uh, uh, as soon as possible? Chris, that is the end of my presentation. <laughs> well, how's that for timing? And thank you very much for that thank introduction and for the fantastic work that the CSIR has done uh, on looking at these uh, uh, green hydrogen and uh, power fuel opportunities for South Africa. And that's the purpose of today, to really to explore these opportunities, both locally and for export. And it's now my great pleasure uh, to introduce everybody to Ambassador Rina Kionke, who's gonna say a few words uh, and is going to uh, contextualize uh, this uh, initiative as well as introduce uh, the Minister uh, of Science and Innovation, who is now with us. A uh, big welcome uh, to Minister Bladen Zamande. And uh, I 
I want to just introduce you to the ambassador. You know, I could read out the ambassador's illustrious resume, but I would rather simply quote some of her words so you may understand what she is all about. Her words are as follows. The EU is South Africa's number one trade and investment partner. And our interest is to support South Africa's national development plan, as well as this country's efforts to address the legacies of apartheid. We wish to work together on, a, on the global challenges, such as combating climate change, working towards a circular economy, promoting human rights, and upholding the international rules-based order. Ladies and gentlemen, the subject of renewable hydrogen and green power fuel opportunities is clearly a matter of huge interest as the, as the attendance at this uh, webinar shows. So without further ado, I would like to now hand over to the European Union Ambassador to South Africa, Dr. Rina Kionka, to do the honors by saying a few words of introduction, officially opening this dialogue and introducing the Minister of Higher Education, Science and Innovation, the Honorable Mr. Bladen Zamandi, who will make the opening keynote address. Ambassador, over to you now. Thank you, Chris. Minister Zimande, colleagues, uh, Special Advisor at the Department of Energy at the European Commission, Mr. Constantinescu, panelists, speakers, ladies and gentlemen, all protocol observed. I must start. with whom the EU has been engaging in the organization of this webinar uh, on this very exciting topic of renewable or green hydrogen and power fuels. And we've already gotten into some of the meat of the discussion. Um, we at the EU see hydrogen as a key component in our efforts to decarbonize the economy in the EU. Hydrogen offers a solution to decarbonize industrial processes and economic sectors where reducing carbon emissions is both urgent and hard to achieve. This, of course, makes hydrogen essential to support the EU's commitment to reach carbon neutrality by 2050, and for the global effort to implement the Paris Agreement while working towards the zero pollution. It goes without saying that the EU fully supports South Africa's efforts to decarbonize its economy, while still giving attention to the critical elements of job creation and transformation, also in keeping with the country's commitments to the Paris Agreement. South Africa plays a leading role in this regard, also on the African continent. We all know about the devastation <clears throat> caused to various economies in the world as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. And we shouldn't, uh, we shouldn't, uh, despite that, lose sight of our collective efforts and our goals to decarbonize. We know that the South African economy has suffered significant damage during this time, and it's clear that the country will need to make use of its full toolbox to address its challenges. But we in the EU are available uh, to become a, an essential tool in the box. So let me reiterate what Chris said in the beginning, um, that the EU is South Africa's most important and most reliable, I would say, trade, investment, and cooperation partner. Now, more than ever before, it's time to take advantage of the strategic partnership between the EU and South Africa. So now's the time for more collaboration uh, and with all spheres, spheres government and uh, business and civil society. Considering the nascent nature of the hydrogen economy, both in Europe and in South Africa, there's lots of work to do. But with this, as Thomas elegantly pointed out to us, uh, comes a lot of opportunities as well. As you will all be well aware, uh, the European Commission launched its hydrogen strategy for a climate neutral Europe in July last year. This comprises the strategic roadmap for hydrogen in the European Union. And my colleague, uh, Mr. Constantinescu, will explain this in much greater detail shortly. The opportunities presented by the hydrogen economy for both the EU and South Africa have been highlighted in an EU-funded study we heard about already uh, undertaken by CSIR. I've seen the study, I've read the study, and uh, I'm, I'm already, my interest is already piqued by what Thomas has said. 
In closing, I would like to reiterate that we as the EU are committed to the future of South Africa. That's clear, that should be clear through the significant investments and cooperation activities that we already undertake in this country. But we want to do more. And we look forward to engaging with our South African counterparts uh, in part to smooth the way for increased partnership between the EU and South Africa on renewables, but also to strengthen our already rather robust strategic partnership. Minister Zimande, you will recall the visit uh, last year of European Com Commission's Executive Vice President Franz Timmermans, who arrived here just before the pandemic hit. And we had a, we had a meeting uh, where you were present as well. Um, uh, he's Mr. Timmermans, for the others, uh, is in charge of the European Green Deal, and he talked a lot about hydrogen uh, while he was here. Now, that was almost a full year ago. So today, at this discussion, we'll start the debate around green or renewable hydrogen um, with Minister and, and as well as the CSIR. So I hope that today kicks off a serious deba debate on both the benefits and the opportunities. Um, that the hydrogen economy provides for South Africa, for the EU. And I look forward together with my colleagues in taking this discussion forward in the coming months. Minister Zimande, it's now my privilege and pleasure to formally introduce you, although you need no introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, you know that Minister Zimande holds the critically important portfolios of higher education, science, and innovation. And those are critically important considering the times that we find in ourselves in that are more and more dominated by innovative technologies. The EU and South Africa have enjoyed many years of close and fruitful collaboration in these areas. And science, technology and innovation is in fact the longest standing cooperation agreement that we have between the EU and South Africa, 17 years old. I've said it before, I'll say it again, um, our science cooperation <clears throat> is one of the absolute pearls of the EU-South Africa strategic partnership. And we're really proud of it. The Department of Science and Technology is a key partner for the EU and includes numerous collaborations with the European Commission's research capacity, extremely valuable participations in EU-funded research, So now, without further ado, I would like to give the floor to the Honorable Minister of Higher Education and Science and Innovation, Dr. Blade Zimande. Uh, Minister, we look forward to hearing uh, more about South Africa's interest in the hydrogen economy and are open to further collaboration. It's a pleasure to see you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much uh, for your kind, kind words. Uh, the Honorable and Distinguished Ambassador of the European Union to South Africa, Dr. Rina Kionka, and thank you very much for your kind introduction. Let me also greet uh, Mr. Tudor Constantinescu, who is the principal advisor to the Director General of Energy at the European Commission. Mr. Chris Yelland, the Managing Director at EE Business Intelligence. And let me also greet all other distinguished guests and participants who are here. As uh, South African language goes, too many to be able to recognize. We normally just say all protocol observed. And of course, I will greet my own uh, departmental team members and uh, my ministry staff and ladies and gentlemen and all the participants. I'm really grateful to be joining you today in this webinar on renewable hydrogen and green power fuel opportunities. Let me start by apologizing for being late. It was an unavoidable commitment, but I was very determined that I will join you and be here today, at least to give this message. These events provide us with an opportunity to also launch a detailed study on power fuels and green hydrogen power fuels and the opportunities arising for South Africa commissioned by the EU South Africa Partners for Growth Program. And indeed to us is yet another important platform 
to strengthen our wonderful relationship between South Africa and the EU. As uh, Honorable Ambassador Kionka has already said, the fact that this event takes place remotely due to COVID-19 does not in any way reduce or minimize our commitment to vigorously promote the development of renewable fuels as key energy sources in our society and our economy at large. What the coronavirus pandemic has taught us is that we need indeed to find new innovative ways to advance our social economic goals and objectives. As we all know, no country has been left unaffected by this, uh, including the ravaging impact of the coronavirus on the global economy as well as national economies. South Africa has been affected in distinctive ways by what we regard as the fourfold crisis facing the globe today. The first crisis is that of COVID-19, which is a health crisis, a pandemic. The second crisis is already what I've alluded to, deepening economic crisis locally and globally. Thirdly, the multiple crisis of social economic sustainability for families, households, and communities. And fourthly, climate change. All these things are deeply interlinked. This webinar also comes at a time when we are, as a country, focusing on taking extraordinary measures for economic reconstruction and recovery to achieve inclusive growth following the devastation caused by COVID-19. This economic recovery plan for South Africa is a plan on which all of us, as South Africans, with all key social partners, have committed to work together The objectives of the plan are clear and they include the following. To create jobs primarily through aggressive infrastructure investment and mass employment programs. To re-industrialize our economy with a particular emphasis on growing small businesses. To accelerate economic reforms to unlock investment and growth. To fight crime and corruption and to build the capacity of our state. All these objectives are linked to the vision of our national development plan. The depth of the crisis caused by COVID-19 has sharpened our resolve to address the many social economic challenges that we face, which unfortunately also have been further exposed by the impact of COVID-19. Our determination is to get our people back into jobs. But as the EU itself has said, we have also embraced that thinking that our economies must not just bounce back, but they must bounce forward. Our president keeps on saying, we don't want to go back to pre-COVID-19 times, but we want to go forward to post-COVID-19 times, which is something very important. That's why therefore we view this webinar on renewable energy and green power fuel opportunities for South Africa amongst the critical and leading instruments towards our economic recovery. As a matter of fact, one of the seven pillars of our economic reconstruction and recovery program is energy, including renewable energy. And there is indeed growing scientific evidence suggesting that accelerated global warming, driven by increased release of CO2 into the atmosphere, deforestation, loss of biodiversity and forms of mass agriculture, driving zoonotic risks, may, all these may lead to the frequent emergence of future global pandemics. Some of the scientists are telling us, we'll be lucky if we finish this decade by 2030 without having had another pandemic. Therefore, future economic planning has to take the stabilization of the Earth's climate and retention of natural capital as central features of our growth strategies. Clearly the shift away from carbon intensive fossil fuels in favor of greener renewable energy forms is crucial in this regard. Alternative and renewable sources of energy like solar and green hydrogen based sources of energy 
are precisely what we need to prevent the world and its life from being destroyed by pandemics in future. The advantage of renewable hydrogen in particular and other green power fuel must make it possible for us to provide cheap and sustainable sources of alternative and renewable energy to ordinary people, the workers and the poor in our country in particular. Renewable energy must not only be accessible to the wealthy and better off in society, but it must be acceptable to all. That is why also this transition to renewable energy, we are insisting together with the rest of the world that it must be a just transition that does not exclude, especially the poor and working people from benefiting. Given the context of today's occasion, I would therefore like to focus my address on how science, technology, and innovation, STI in short, could play an important role in providing solutions to a sustainable and inclusive economic development. I'll do this obviously also through sharing with what we are doing in South Africa, especially in the area of hydrogen economy. In our innovation-led economic growth and development strategy, the key challenge is that of addressing what is sometimes referred to as the innovation chasm, which provides for the addressing and removing barriers that slows down and in some cases prevents the movement of ideas and inventions from the laboratory into the productive economy and society. This is a challenge that South Africa has long identified and which our president, Mr. Cyril Ramaphosa, requires and expects of my Department of Science and Innovation to address by focusing sharply on removing all barriers to enable South Africa to successfully overcome the innovation chasm. In demonstrating this commitment, our president has also brought together the Department of Higher Education and Training on the one side and the Department of Science and Innovation on the other under one ministry so that these two can be closely aligned. Indeed, it remains our intention to fully utilize this new platform and further strengthen our innovation-led development. Some of our new higher education science and innovation landscape opportunities that can be exploited is the advancement of the renewable hydrogen and green power fuel industry and the role that, for instance, some of our education and training authorities in the different sectors like energy, water, wholesale and retail can play a very important role by launching a training program, for instance, to expand skills development. We have already instructed our agencies that are dealing with education and training to prioritize this by ensuring that we escalate skills provision on this front. The entities in my two departments also should exploit these opportunities, including of course involvement of our technical and vocational education and training colleges in such initiatives, mainly because also we need skills at all levels, including mid-level skills that we get from our technical and vocational education and training colleges that in South Africa we need in abundance. It also seems to us very important that we don't leave our technical and vocational education and training colleges behind, that these institutions in partnership with industry must begin training what sometimes are referred to as green artisans and other mid-level skills, as I've said. I'm proud that my department, through what we have called Hydrogen South Africa, it's HYSA in short. We've launched this program in partnership with what we call Bambili Energy, a women owned company, the University of Pretoria and the Water and Energy Sector Education and Training Authority. All these have started to provide training to our vocational colleges and to our universities of technology to produce graduates who will actually be able to install and maintain the hydrogen fuel cells. 
We are pleased to say a first cohort of trainees have graduated from this program in December last year. On the further development of skills by academia, through our premier research body, the National Research Foundation, which is a state entity falling under my department, we've continued to develop skilled workers that are capable to generate new ideas and knowledge. And a significant portion of the National Research Fund budget to date goes to human resources development in these critical areas. The South African Research Chairs Initiative, which is a government program pushed by my department to support cutting edge and high level research in different areas and its sectors of excellence initiatives have become invaluable research instruments to develop and promote new technologies, new knowledge and skills in new fields. It should be noted that this is a fraction of investments made by the Department of Higher Education and Training, which is my other department in skills development, and therefore in making use of the new higher education, science and innovation landscape a lot more pivotal. Our renewable energy programs are not just producing the next generation of scientists and engineers for the workforce, but the next generation of business leaders, entrepreneurs, innovators and public sector managers and policy experts in these fields. South Africa has a comparative advantage when it comes to renewable hydrogen and green power fuels. We have a unique competitive advantage in the production of green power fuels. The exceptional wind and solar natural resources, which together with abundant low cost land, 50 years of experience in the in the commercial production of synthetic fuels using the Fisher Tropsch process and good shipping access to the rapidly growing international markets of the EU and the Far East, including China and Japan, should position us as a key role player in renewable hydrogen and green power fuels, both locally and internationally. In other words, we must use our more than 3,000 800 kilometers of sea line as a crucial entry point into the rest of the world. In December 2019, my Department of Science and Innovation appointed an independent panel of experts to review the second phase of implementation of Hydrogen South Africa program. At the end of the second phase of implementation, over 1 billion rand had been invested at the early stage of the implementation of this program, we succeeded to attain outputs such as publications, masters and PhD students and registered patents. The key challenge now, ladies and gentlemen, is to turn this intellectual capital into developmental and commercial gains to fuel the next generation companies to drive the energy economy of the future. According to the second Hydrogen South Africa five-year review, there is a lack of an overarching policy on a South African hydrogen economy. Of course, this is a threat in addressing this. That is why I am determined that personally as minister, I will be very actively involved in ensuring that we create the right environment and the policy space and the policy levers to drive a hydrogen economy in South Africa with maximum possible international cooperation. Of course, with EU being one of our most important partners on this journey. South Africa is one of the pioneers in terms of developing a hydrogen strategy, which we launched back in 2007. From January 2019 to December 2020, 18 more countries released their national hydrogen strategies linking the growth of a hydrogen economy towards supporting a green and secular economy to speed up economic recovery post COVID-19. In our country, this strategy is led by my Department of Science and Innovation. As a country building on the strategy, we developed also a South African hydrogen roadmap to set out a vision 
for an inclusive hydrogen society so that an enabling compact between industry, labor, community, and government can be developed. This hydrogen society roadmap will assist and enable us to be able as government and industrial stakeholders to put in place a policy framework required to promote the exploitation of the benefits that hydrogen provides through its, its integration into the various sectors of the economy. It is our aim, ladies and gentlemen, and honorable ambassador, to position this policy framework to leverage on the existing relevant government policy documents, as well as identify gaps within our own regulatory regime that needs to be addressed. In addition, this policy framework will leverage on the successes achieved through Hydrogen South Africa uh, RDI program to transition our research and development and demonstration phase into the commercial phase and ultimately lead to the achievement of economic and social benefits for the country. Through our Department of Science and Innovation, we commenced stakeholder engagement process, I'm pleased to say, in June last year, with over 50 stakeholders across the private sector, government, and parastatals. At the end of November 2020, the project team completed the first draft of the Hydrogen Society Roadmap and we are now hard at work to ensure that we integrate the issue of gender equity and social inclusion in this process. It is our considered view that this process should form a major part of our sectors, the STI sector, contribution to the economic reconstruction and recovery plan, targeting hydrogen and the fuel cell sector. Ladies and gentlemen, honorable ambassador, South Africa also participates in international partnerships that support science diplomacy in renewable hydrogen and green power fuels. As a country we will put in place, I'm pleased to say, strategic international partnerships, especially with countries looking to import and trade in the global hydrogen value chain. The EU once more is a very important strategic partner which we are committed to strengthen relations with. We will also ensure that our local universities and the private sector are given an opportunity to play a pivotal role in the green hydrogen economy. Our research development and innovation will be critical to ensure that the cost of electrolyzer technology is reduced and that green hydrogen and power fuels production is scaled up in order to bring the price of the commodity at parity with gray hydrogen. As part of our commitments made under our white paper on science, technology, and innovation, which was adopted by cabinet in 2019, as a department of science and innovation, we aim to attract foreign investment into South Africa with a target to secure at least 15% of South Africa's gross expenditure on research and development from international sources with a long-term goal to grow the ratio over time. For instance, one of the most important decisions made by cabinet contained in the white paper is that as a country we want to establish a sovereign innovation fund, which will be used to attract both public and private sector resources so that we have a fund that will drive innovation in our country and also drive cooperation with the rest of the world. As a department, we made available 1.2 billion rands worth of funding proposals in the 2020-21 financial year to international funding calls in areas relevant to enabling South African academia and the private sector participation in the global hydrogen economy. So we are putting our little money to where our mouths are. Through this process, we received a total of five proposal, proposals, sorry, ranging from smaller 
to larger funding amounts. These proposals for the interest of the audience include the following. The EU Green Deal Funding Core with a Hydrogen Corridor Consortium. The EU Green Deal Funding Core on Carbon Capture and Use Consortium. The Client 2 Carbon Capture and Use Consortium. The French South Africa Bilateral on Hydrogen. Importantly, also the African Union and European Union long-term joint EU-AU Research and Innovation Partnership on renewable energy. As South Africa, we are absolutely clear that we don't live in an island. We live, we are part of the African continent. What we do in South Africa must be able to radiate and have a positive impact on the continent and vice versa in terms of working in these areas. The officials from my department will provide details on these proposals should you require more information. However, I would like to, like to make a, a brief reflection on the official launch of a detailed study on green power fuels and the opportunities arising for South Africa, commissioned by EU South Africa Partners for Growth Pro Program. This program supports the EU delegation in South Africa in its effort to maximize bilateral trade and investment flows between the EU and South Africa. Power fuels are synthetic gaseous or liquid fuels based on renewable hydrogen, which is hydrogen too, obtained by the electrolysis of water using renewable electricity. Power fuels comprise pure hydrogen, hydrocarbons and ammonia. What I cannot forget by the way is that, is the importance of the platinum minerals in the hydrogen fuel economy very cheap. And in South Africa, at the moment, we are holding the single largest reserves uh, of platinum that's still to be mined, a very important platform. Some power fuels are hydrocarbons, in which case the carbon required for their production must be obtained from captured CO2. A technical workshop on power fuels was also held in December 2019 in South Africa, hosted by the EU South Africa Partnership, together with Vitz Business School. The aim of this workshop was to explore the potential of a power fuels economy in South Africa and to identify hurdles that could hinder the establishment of South Africa as a major supplier to Europe and other power markets. Moving towards ending, a honorable program director and our honorable and distinguished Your Excellency, uh, Ambassador Kionka, following from the very successful workshop that I'm talking about, the EU South Africa partnership will be hosting a study tour to, to Europe to demonstrate to the participants power fuels mm -hmm. expertise and know-how. Selected South African companies and relevant government policymakers will be invited to visit industrial plants market leaders and EU officials in order to strengthen their understanding of the potential and benefits of power fuels. In this regard, a research paper was commissioned by the EU South Africa partnership to prepare for this power fuels study tour. I would therefore like to take this opportunity to thank the EU South Africa partnership, to thank Ambassador Kionka and the Vitz Business School for this groundbreaking initiative. I also wish to take the opportunity to thank and congratulate all the individuals and companies that will be involved in this study tour as well. To end, I want to indicate that COVID-19 is likely to stay for the foreseeable future. For this reason, I need to say we should stay alert and keep our planning within the sector to accommodate the unavoidable changes brought by this pandemic. Our government has taken a decision that whatever we speak, we must say this, that there is a, a vaccine now or vaccines does not mean we must drop our guard in terms of maintaining the health protocols. Thank you very much for taking your time attending to this webinar. I wish you all a fruitful, 
and progressive engagement throughout this session. Let us keep on keeping safe. Thank you very much. Uh, Minister Nzamande, thank you for those extremely inspiring words uh, and it has given us courage uh, to face this decarbonization challenge that we have and to use this as an opportunity to overcome uh, the difficulties of the past uh, and to prepare ourselves for the new world of energy, uh, a world in which hydrogen is going to have to play an absolutely critical role. And it's really uh, heartening to hear of all these initiatives uh, stretching uh, from education uh, through to research, through to industrialization uh, and commercialization of these incredible opportunities where we do have a strategic competitive advantage uh, in, in, in the production of uh, green power fuels and green hydrogen. So thank you indeed for your time and effort that you put into it and for honoring us with your presence. It has been very insightful and I'm sure has been encouraging uh, to the ambassador and, and, and uh, to uh, her delegation to South Africa uh, to hear of this uh, renewed uh, and, and strong cooperation between South Africa and the EU. So thank you, Minister. I do understand uh, you have to uh, rush off. Uh, we know that you have an incredibly busy timetable. Uh, and so we will not uh, hold you uh, any longer. Uh, you have done us proud uh, in being here and giving us uh, a great deal of depth uh, that uh, leads to excitement about this uh, new opportunity uh, for South Africa, both in the export world, as well as the local uh, green economy. Thank you, Minister. So it's now my pleasure to, uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to welcome our next uh, presenter, uh, and uh, he has been referred to by both the ambassador and uh, the minister, and that is uh, Dr. Tudor Constantinescu, who is the principal advisor to the Director General for Energy in the European Commission. He's an engineer and economist by education. Before joining the commission as executive director, he set up the Buildings Performance Institute of Europe. He was the president of the Romanian Agency for Energy Conservation. And between 1996 and 2007, he coordinated the energy efficiency uh, and related environmental activities of the Energy Charter Secretariat in Brussels. So, uh, 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 Tudor, you are welcome uh, to this webinar. Uh, we know that you have played an enormous and key role in the development of the hydrogen strategy for Europe. And it's uh, as we embark on this path going forward, we are very keen to hear what you have to say. So over to you, uh, Tudor, and um, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for um, inviting me. I'm uh, very pleased to be here. And thank you very much also to Mr. Dimande and to Ambassador Konka for their introduction. I'm um, uh, going to try to share if, uh, if you are patient a second, because I hope to succeed to share a short presentation with you, uh, which should be possible. I don't know if you see it. Uh, we don't see it yet, uh, but let's just wait a few seconds to see whether it comes online. Have you shared it? Uh, uh, now, now I'm about to to do it, uh, but I don't know what is going wrong here. Sure. Yes, it, uh, is, it is coming on. Um, let's just see. Okay, now, can now is it okay? Yes. Can you just maximize it? Uh, you know, into a. Into can I maximize a, it? Yes, that's okay. quite right. Thank you. That's quite right. Glad to hear this. Okay. Thank you. As I said, very, very pleased to be with you here today. Thanks both to, to the minister and to our ambassador. And I had the pleasure also to listen a bit to the study presentation. I think it's a very interesting and very important also a piece of work to pave the way to uh, hydrogen developments to tapping the potential for renewable hydrogen in South Africa, which we know is so important, and also to pave the way to the collaboration with the EU, which I think is extremely important, and we have enjoyed cooperation in both bilateral relations and in multilateral relations 
uh, in the Commission, I had the pleasure to chair the International Partnership for Energy Efficient Economy. So, and I know the active role of South Africa there as uh, well in, in the Clean Energy Ministerial and where we have an hydrogen initiative as well. So, this, uh, this, uh, this being said, let me quickly, also in the interest of the time, uh, pass through the main elements which I want to share with you. The Green Deal was one of the first announcements of our President von der Leyen. And the Green Deal came as a motivation to make Europe really the first carbon neutral continent. We had scenarios and analysis even before that, looking at how to decarbonize in long term. But I have to admit, most of the scenarios were putting the pressure after 2030. What is really changing the Green Deal is that by advancing action, by putting uh, an objective of 55% decarbonization already by 2030, it means we have to start investing now. So we have to start decarbonize now and in a way to avoid locking effects in fossil fuels investments maybe or stranded assets and already in the coming years to pave the way for the energy transition in a more cost effective way. More capex, more investments now, reduced operational costs in longer time. This is a big philosophy of, uh, of uh, which you have to look because this will bring a lot of, so of jobs, a lot of investments. Um, most of the investments and the jobs are we see, and this is the IA analysis, for example, in the area of energy efficiency. This creates most of the jobs, but next to it is renewables. So this is what we speak about. And when we now have to refer, the minister also mentioned the dramatic context of the pandemic and the sanitary crisis, which also led to economic troubles and challenges. Now we speak about economic recovery. The objectives of the Green Deal, the way of acting under the Green Deal actually should be very much supportive to get us out also of the economic crisis generated by the pandemics. So in, in, in this process, of course, we have a number of principles and uh, uh, it's clear we speak about circular economy, we speak overall efficiency, we want to have sustainable finance and not to leave anyone be behind. This is clearly important elements of the, of the Green Deal. And in support of the Green Deal, we came uh, during uh, 2020 with a number of important initiatives. The Renovation Wave Strategy, yeah, which I was mentioning, the buildings are important because uh, consume and uh, are responsible for 40% in Europe of the consumption, about 36% of emissions. So we want to double the renovation rate for buildings, but also to make them more performing, the new ones, also to link them more to uh, mobility and in particular to green mobility. And therefore, uh, to, to develop uh, a more uh, sustainable ecosystem. At the same time, we look at the offshore renewable strategy. So we need more renewables. And I'll refer why, but it's important to tap all the potential we have for renewables in, uh, in, in Europe, but also in the neighborhood and across the globe because the offshore potential was clearly neglected so far. Now, an important element we looked, it's uh, energy system integration. So a more integrated approach. Let me briefly say just that now 23% of our final energy consumption is electricity, you know, but by 2050, we expect to be about 50%. But still the remaining part, maybe some biogas and so, but most of it will be not in the form of electrons, will be molecules. And these molecules, if we want to achieve carbon neutrality, have to be decarbonized as well. Therefore, it's essential that we look into how to decarbonize uh, the gaseous and liquid fuels as well. And this is where hydrogen comes actually with a very strong impact, with very strong uh, uh, opportunities and to support not only the energy system and the electricity system and the grid stabilization with these high shares of renewables, but also to decarbonize the other sectors of the economy, in particular heavy duty, but also refining industries, fertilizers industries, and gradually steel and cement, all carbon intensive industries for which in some cases maybe the best uh, available uh, option. So the strategy therefore comes in this context of the energy system integration with an investment agenda, boosting demand and uh, scaling up supply, looking at the aspects related to the necessary infrastructure and the markets, research and innovation, the international dimension. And for all that, 
We have created also a hydrogen alliance, was launched at the same time with the system integration of the hydrogen strategy in July, which tries to bring together all the major actors, uh, being industrial players, being regional authorities, being national authorities, being researchers, so that we create big projects, the so-called important projects of common European interest, but not only, and which will help tapping the potential for hydrogen in the various sectors of, uh, of the economy. Um, the, the strategy is basically uh, having a step approach with concrete targets on electrolyzers by 2024, 2030, 6 gigawatts, 40 gigawatts, more, starting first to decarbonize the existing hydrogen production, which is over 95% of fossil fuel based, and towards 2030, creating more opportunities in transport, in uh, carbon intensive industries, creation of hydrogen valleys and the infrastructure. By 2050, really tapping the entire potential. By then, hydrogen, which is now less than 1%, could be 14% of, of the energy mix. So it's important to bear this in mind. And then we play an important role in decarbonizing a lot of other sectors, including uh, those who are difficult to decarbonize and also sometimes indirectly through synthetic gases and synthetic fuels, which were mentioned also in, in the study earlier. And we think that really indeed very important and maybe one of the important areas to cooperate with uh, Europe. This is wholly also an investment agenda. This is just to give an indication that we speak about 40 billion euros to be invested over the next decade just in Europe, not speaking about the neighborhood area where industry has plans as well, but what is more important is to trigger a lot of investments in renewables, 80 to 120 gigawatts, which translates into 200 to 300 over billion of euros to be invested in this field. And again, infrastructure and the end use sector. So it's a really investment agenda and from this perspective supports job creation, supports also economic recovery and not only economic recovery, modernization of economies and sustainable pathways for developing the economy for the future, which is equally important for Europe and for South Africa. In terms of demand, we look, as I said, to, to replace the 10 million tons of hydrogen we currently produce, and in this way to reduce the carbon footprint of 7 to 100 million tons of CO2, to decarbonize the fertilizers and later on the steel, to make use of hydrogen in heavy duty transport and gradually also in maritime and aviation. So these are the main uh, principles. And what is important here to underline um, that we need to have a common language, not only in Europe, among uh, us, the member states, but also uh, globally. So the certification of renewable and low carbon hydrogen is very important. There is a work stream going on on this with the International Partnership on Hydrogen Economy and with the Clean Energy Ministry. So I hope you will also uh, join in, in this journey. High hydrogen supply infrastructure is equally important. We know that not all the um, hydrogen can be produced and used locally. We see big benefits in this industrial cluster and in particular in the coastal areas where uh, the proximity enables, if you want, the best economic case. But with the needs we will have, it's clear that we also need to transport hydrogen at longer distances. And if it is still hydrogen, this can be done by using, in some cases, a uh, gas infrastructure, either in some cases through blending or maybe even more efficient to repurposing. But in other cases, we'll need to, to, to have uh, for longer distance even transport of hydrogen organized as uh, another energy carrier. So we, we work on all this. We try to support and uh, therefore uh, producers through uh, different mechanisms like contract uh, carbon for difference for in particular low carbon hydrogen but also for renewable hydrogen we try to see if we could have targets for renewable hydrogen in different sectors and for the infrastructure to adapt already the trans uh, 10e the trans infrastructure energy network uh, for energy was uh, tabled last uh, last winter and hydrogen finds now a place in it to really develop hydrogen infrastructure in the next 10 year network development plans. In terms of research and innovation, Europe was at the front lead since many years. We invested a lot, in particular through the field cells and hydrogen joint undertaking, again, a partnership with industry and research community. 
And we succeed to move from 10 kilowatt electrolyzers 10 years ago to 10 megawatt now in operation in a refinery of Shell in Cologne. And uh, uh, 20 megawatt is under construction currently uh, in the Netherlands and we'll, uh, we'll have now a call for 100 megawatt electrolyzer. So this is scaling up. Again, work needs to go on modernizing and adapting the infrastructure also for end use applications and for fuel cells, in particular for maritime applications, sometimes can be for fuel cells on ammonia. Also, we, we have to explore all these opportunities and to make it uh, cost effective and increase in any case for all these opportunities, the aspects related, the importance of aspects related to standardization, related to uh, reduced use of critical raw materials, recycling and of course, limiting the environmental impact. Safety for hydrogen is known that is an important issue and it will continue to be an important issue in all application will think being on production on end use side. Internationally, of course, we play a lot of uh, attention, first of all, to the neighboring uh, ring country and is part of the neighborhood investment uh, platform, the discussion on clean hydrogen. We try to, to develop research and development programs through association agreements, and this is an important component of the Africa-Europe Green uh, Initiative. It's important really to make hydrogen an important uh, component of the whole discussions, including bilateral discussions, uh, in the energy dialogues, in the trade, in the international collaboration, and in the international fora. I mentioned already the issue of certification, how important it is with the International Partnership for Hydrogen Economy, which also works on on regulations, on codes and standards, but also with the Clean Energy Ministry, we plan to launch a port consortium. We look at what countries have in terms of objectives and targets uh, across the globe, and we do this in cooperation with the IA and the mission innovation to which we have launched the concept of Hydrogen Valley, you know, and which is uh, proving to be very successful and is a flagship which was mentioned also by, by our president. In the end, all this should help also building international markets for, for hydrogen. And um, this is very important. We are aiming to have a benchmark for euro denominated transactions in hydrogen and to really facilitate emergence of uh, uh, an international market uh, and the rules-based hydrogen market at the global level. Uh, let me conclude that uh, the Alliance has started just the week before to work. Over 800 companies in Europe have expressed interest and tried to take part in the different roundtables, being production, being transport, end use application, energy storage for, for hydrogen, creating, identifying important projects. Some of them will be seen as important projects of common European interest. And we try to adapt the regulatory form, framework, not only for energy, but all the aspects related to policy in relation to taxation, to state aid regime, which you know is very important in Europe to enable this uh, potential for hydrogen to really develop and to uh, really contribute fully in a cost-effective way, of course, to and affordable to the decarbonization, to the long-term objective of carbon neutrality for Europe. And at the same time, if it is a bridge in the energy system, we very much see it as a bridge for international collaboration and for cooperation. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, uh, Tudor Con uh, Constantinescu uh, from the European Union, uh, the principal advisor to the uh, Director General for Energy in the European Commission. Uh, thank you indeed for your time and for joining us uh, from all the way from uh, Brussels. And uh, I think you've given us a really good picture of where we should be thinking and how we should be approaching our uh, journey as we, as we look to growing hydrogen as an important uh, part of our energy mix. So uh, it's now my pleasure to introduce to you uh, two presenters from the port of Rotterdam, Europe's biggest port, I'm told. Uh, and the presenters today are uh, Monica Swanson, who is the business manager, international hydrogen projects at the Port of Rotterdam International, where she runs a number of international hydrogen supply chain initiatives. Her focus is on building um, a strategic coalitions worldwide to help create hydrogen supply chains and corridors of the future. One of her focus areas is South Africa. Her areas of expertise include hydrogen shipping, 
port development for the green transition and digitization of ports. And she's joined by her colleague, uh, Mark Artson, uh, who is the program manager, International Ports uh, Projects at the Port Rotterdam International, uh, where he has extensive experience as an investment manager and port consultant and in establishing business participation. His areas of expertise are mergers and acquisitions, corporate finance, and port developments. So it's a really great pleasure for me to welcome Monica and Mark. And I'm now going to hand over to Monica to do the honors. Uh, if you would like to share your uh, screen, Monica. Thank you, Chris. I'll just pull up my slides. Thank you for having us in this webinar. I'm just going to pull them up. They're coming up. Can you yep. all see them? Yes, we can. Loud and clear. Wonderful. Clear. OK. Um, well, bye, Adanki, for making time for listening to this. Um, we were already introduced kindly by Chris, uh, my colleague Mark, who will not be presenting, and myself. We're both available for questions on anything that's being presented today or anything around our port. So please do not hesitate, hesitate to contact us uh, after this uh, webinar or put your questions forward. I can't see the questions in the chat, so I will rely on um, others if you, know, if you have any I need to answer during or shortly after my presentation. Um, first of all, because I'm aware that we working in this port know it quite well, but not all of you will be familiar with Port of Rotterdam, uh, ports in general, and the kind of port we are. So just a quick introduction of that too. Um, first of all, it's rather a large port. Um, it's the largest port in Europe. It used to be the biggest port in the world up to, I think, 2003. And then a lot of very positive economic developments on the Pacific side, uh, Ch China, India, Australia, that area, uh, didn't make us any smaller, but other ports grew bigger. So that's a very good development in the world. Uh, we're now number 10 in the world first of Europe, but it's not a competition. I just want to indicate to you, you know, the dimensions of things. Uh, there's a total employment dependency of some 385 people working in or indirectly uh, with our port, in our port. Um, all of, you know, you could say all the major companies, um, working in the oil and gas industry will also do business in Rotterdam. And I'm saying this to emphasize our role as an energy hub. Uh, we, we, we do all kinds of trades. There's some 30,000 sea vessels and 110, 120,000 barges operating in the waters. You can see on the left-hand side in, in the picture. Um, and these barges are actually quite important because they also sail into the hinterland, into Germany, into France, into Belgium, into Austria. Um, we have train connections, uh, road connections, and barges and pipelines. Um, and this makes us a port that receives a lot of goods, a lot of energy, but also containers, food, anything really, all trades, and can easily distribute them to other countries in Europe. Um, we really are a gateway port, uh, and you could say a gateway to northwestern Europe. 13% um, of energy imported for the EU comes in via Rotterdam. So that's quite a, quite a lot. And um, well, you are a huge country, country and I just heard, heard you have about 3,800 kilometers of coastline. So potentially a huge opportunity to have ports and, and, and receive ships. Um, so it, our port, although it's considered a big port, is only some 40 kilometers. But in a tiny country like all ours, which is only 200 by 300 kilometers, uh, this port is quite, of course, substantial. It's a big wedge of our country. And um, as you can see from the, the colored industrial zones, there's a lot of, you know, the pink areas, chemicals, refineries, and energy clusters. Important, we'll get back to that later. Um, now, if you look at the current oil and gas trade, it's an international thing. Uh, 
Uh, Rotterdam plays an important part in it, but it's a worldwide thing, of course. And why is this relevant? Because what we think is going to happen for hydrogen is it's going to have similar dynamics. It's going to be an international traded new feedstock and fuel. While we now have coal and uh, oil and gas coming into our port, LNG, all kinds of stuff, a lot of that will be replaced by hydrogen and hydrogen carriers. Now, we all know the picture where, you know, some areas uh, uh, have the right conditions for renewables. This is a version where all the arrows point probably from Australian perspective. And you can see that South Africa didn't get an arrow here and nor did the Netherlands but, uh, or Northwestern Europe. But you can see that climate wise, South Africa has very, very good conditions. And that Europe, and especially the northern part of Europe where our port is situated and which our port services, uh, well, uh, the light green doesn't predict a lot of good for our uh, own uh, capabilities for energy production. So we're going to be an importing country for energy, which puts us on the alert because this means we need to be a country that looks at other countries to get that energy. This is nothing new. This is already what's going on. Uh, but for the renewables and to be a zero emission country, this will be even more strongly the case because we simply do not have the right conditions for renewables where we might have had the good conditions for natural gas. So different ball game. And if you look at this power shift and if you would imagine the, hour, the arrows also going from your country, uh, just think about this huge change in the world, you know, moving from the traditional gas and oil trade towards a hydrogen trade where you with your conditions for renewables could be quite central to this picture. And what we're really looking at is a power shift. I mean, literally a power shift. So that's very interesting. What you see happening in the world now, um, this is an image from a very recent IRENA report, is that all countries in the world are reconsidering their energy mix. And many now also stepping up on H2 publishing, as, as was already uh, mentioned earlier, uh, their hydrogen visions and roadmaps. And I know South Africa is also working on this now. Um, this is not a race, but this is a joint effort. It's not like one needs to be ahead of the other, but it's something we need to do, all of us, because demand is looking like it's going to be huge. And as was mentioned also by Thomas Rose, who, by the way, together with his colleague, uh, wrote an extremely good report um, on the subject, uh, one of the best I read in the past year, actually. Um, renewable energy, energy in South Africa is now uh, already 40% cheaper than alternatives from traditional fuels. So very interesting development, uh, which means if this were a race, you could be front runner. Um, as a port, um, we are very interested, of course, in getting um, these flows going and uh, receiving them in our port and ensuring we can distribute them into a, the hinterland where the customers are. Um, so we're looking at shipping of hydrogen and it, we're looking at export and connecting to countries who are looking at export. Um, our main concerns now, and these are challenges everybody's looking at, at because it's a new game. Shipping of hydrogen is new. Um, first, we need to find production sites and countries to work with who can reduce the cost of production and logistics together with us. Cost of production, production being largely determined by the cost of electricity. Um, then the carrier choice, there's all kinds of pros and cons to these. Uh, I've just mentioned a few, the most you know, currently popular ones. You know, there's new insights being gained on a daily basis. Um, LOHC, which is an oily substance, liquid H2, methanol, ammonia, they keep sort of, you know, uh, popping up as likely uh, carriers where liquid is something for the, for the future because of the cost of it, as it seems now. Um, cost, the 
the energy efficiency, the ease of transportation, and also safety are very important ele elements which keep, you know, uh, being having to balance in, in choices being made. Um, in our port, we're doing uh, uh, quite a number of projects on hydrogen. I will talk about that in a bit. We're also looking at actual shipping pilots, uh, doing pre-feasibility studies, one of which is in Northern Africa, another is in Portugal. Um, and it's very difficult, I can tell you, to make these decisions. Uh, it seems easy to opt for ammonia because it's cheapest, you can realize it fast, but then you have toxicity and then you have, you know, the safety of transportation into the hinterland. So there's you know, you have to at some point decide because otherwise you can't start. It is difficult to make a decision, it's still a challenge. But there's options and there's improvements and there's enormously fast developing technology helping us. Um, another challenge, number three, is to increase production volumes fast enough. It needs to be stepped up. I will show you a bit of our market expectations in, in, in following slides. Um, we need more, much more hydrogen to meet demand because demand is now being pushed by EU Green Deal policies. Uh, the, the, the transportation market is being um, stimulated, is being helped forward, pushed forward. Uh, all kinds of legislation, regulation is being developed, uh, subsidy schemes also with Africa, but also inside Europe for international cooperation. They're all going on. How do we build um, a large stable market around hydrogen? These are key questions and it's happening. The large oil and gas companies traditionally, you know, remaining on the oil and gas side are also stepping in, also doing that stuff, but also the traditional gas providers like, uh, for instance, Air Liquide and others, uh, they of course are moving forward faster than ever because this market is going to be quite big. And why do we do this? Not, not just because of, you know, economic perspective, but because of climate agreements and the necessity to meet zero emission targets. Um, if you look at Rotterdam, this of course is a very simple representation of what we're doing. What we're looking at, this is something we've been working on, on since 2016. Uh, at the core of our plans is a, a backbone structure for hydrogen. This white pipeline you see in this picture is going to connect all the industry now working with, apologies, now working with hydrogen, which is grey hydrogen. Uh, what we're first going to do is reduce carbon emissions in our port from all those industrial cl clusters I showed you earlier by uh, storing and capturing and storing CO2 and storing it underneath sea level in the so-called Porthos project. So we're going to capture the CO2 now produced. There's about almost half a million kilotons, or sorry, half a million tons of hydrogen being used in our port industry right now. So that's already quite a substantial sort of um, customer group, you could say. Uh, they need to first store the, and store the um, carbons, but in about 10 years, we're not, no longer looking at blue hydrogen, as that's called. We're going to look at green hydrogen. There's wind uh, energy, being set up on the coastline. We're going to lead that wind energy into our port. And there we go again, sorry, my mouse is a bit sensitive there. Um, and we have electrolyzer sites being built, planned and built as we speak. Uh, companies like Shell, BP, Norian, Air Liquide, they're all looking at a kind of activity in our port. And we're grateful for that because we need to transition our, in, our industries towards greener pastures, right? Um, once that's all been done and once we have the green electricity generated here, it's going to go into this pipeline and provide hydrogen to um, industry. Not only in Rotterdam, it will also connect to the national gas grid. grid. We're working together with Groningen Port for that and NAM and Shell and the Gas Unie. And it's also going to connect to um, a very important industrial area we service with about 40% of energy use in Europe there, uh, namely the, the German North Rhine-Westphalia area, other parts of the Netherlands as well to be connected, but it's going to be like a backbone with a long pipeline moving into Germany. Now, if you look at this little image of a ship, this is actually why I'm here with you. 
uh, because um, even though we're going to have our own electrolyzer site and have a lot of production of hydrogen, this will not meet demand by far. I said before, we need to be an importing country of energy, and this will be very, very true for hydrogen. So we're looking to import by ship as part of the plan. Now, the timelines for this. Um, in 2023, we're going to have the first electrolyzer operational. We're going to have a road transportation project. Uh, we're also working on that. 2025, we want to have a minimum of 500 hydrogen powered trucks uh, for the corridor between our port and other important areas. Uh, now, the first shipments of hydrogen, we are expecting them in 2024. Likely ammonia, potentially other carriers, we're still looking at options there. Could also be LOHC, could also be methanol, still looking at that. Um, now, why do we need it and what kind of volumes are we looking at? Uh, well, this is our tiny weeny country here in the, on the left-hand side. Um, having this huge port, which we need to distribute hydrogen into Europe with. Uh, if you look at that yellow triangle here, you can see a timeline at the bottom from 2030 to 2050. And you can see from 2020 to 2030, we will be using green, blue, you know, with the captured and some green hydrogen, as according to our estimates, which we've been studying and exchanging with a lot of companies and uh, scientific institutes. So the first 10 years from, well, actually, we're already in the next nine years, we're looking at a mix of gray, blue and green hydrogen. But considering the fact that you know, the EU and we as a country as well have committed to green hydrogen because we really want to achieve zero emission. Um, from 2020, we will need a lot more of hydrogen and it will have to be green. And this is why we're looking at all these countries who have good conditions for renewables um, to help us produce and for us to be your, core, your target market one of your target markets, because of course, Japan and Korea also need hydrogen. But Europe is a very, very big market with uh, a lot of uh, programs to put that hydrogen market economy into place. Um, in the end, at the top of that sale, that yellow triangle, we're looking at needing 20 million tons coming in via Rotterdam. Um, that's huge. That's really a lot more than what is being produced worldwide, green hydrogen wise. And when we look at South Africa, we look at its potential versus the market need. Um, it has such huge potential. You're a quite fortunate country in that sense. Um, you could produce it competitively. Uh, you, could, you could have solar wind and you could have very low energy prices because of your good conditions for renewables. Now, there will be internal use of renewables and hydrogen. There should be internal use. And but yeah, we also think the trade of hydrogen could put South Africa in a very good economical competitive position uh, as, a, as a supplier of hydrogen to other countries. And um, what's very interesting here is, although uh, other countries might be a bit closer to the Netherlands, uh, and to Northwestern Europe, uh, shipping distance doesn't really seem to be, you know, the, the price element that changes the, the end price in the port of destination so much. So that competition, if it were a competition, that market, I should say, is open to you. Um, total market in the European Union expected to be some 60 million tons per annum. 20, as I said, we could handle and should handle via Rotterdam to open that market for other countries. And we are expecting to source from many countries because those volumes really are huge. Uh, but we expect and hope that South Africa will be one of the main suppliers for hydrogen in the future. Um, there is a market out there and um, we would like to work with your country and your people. If you need us for any questions, uh, this is how you can contact us.
And this was my presentation. So I think we have time for questions, if you like, an hour later. Uh, thank you very much, Monica, for a again another inspiring talk that opens the eyes to the opportunities of a demand-driven reindustrialization of South Africa uh, for this in insatiable appetite for uh, green hydrogen, which is going to have to come from countries that can produce it competitively, that have got the right solar and wind resources uh, to, to meet this demand. Uh, and it seems to me that no single country can uh, satisfy this demand. Uh, and interesting that you've talked about the cost of transportation not being that bigger determinant. Uh, of course, it is a, it, it does affect the final price, but uh, not to the extent that people would imagine. And also the cost of desalinization, we heard, is not that big a cost uh, in, in, in the final price determination. So uh, great uh, opportunities for South Africa that have been made absolutely clear by, by, by Monica, uh, backed up by Mark. So uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's now time for a break. Uh, we are running quite heavily over time, uh, but I think it's really important that we should stretch our legs and have a little comfort break. Uh, so I'm going to uh, call uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, this break and um, ask you to join us back here at uh, 4 o'clock, 4 p.m. South Africa time, uh, as we now uh, move to a comfort break. Uh, and let me just uh, make sure that I've got the right slide <laughs> on my screen, uh, and I hope you can see it. Uh, that we are now in the comfort break zone. And can we please report back um, at 4 p.m. after a stretch of legs, uh, which is long overdue and I'm sure is going to be very welcome uh, to all of us. Thank you uh, for your attention and we'll see you shortly. Well, uh, welcome back, uh, ladies and gentlemen, after that comfort break. Um, we have much needed, uh, and it's been a marathon session, uh, but I hope you'll agree that we've had an incredible lineup of presenters. Uh, there's more to come, uh, two more presentations, uh, and I think uh, this is really opening our eyes to the potential of a new um, energy carrier, uh, a new energy uh, source, uh, to diversify our mix, to help with the decarbonization of the transportation sector. Uh, there are huge opportunities both locally and internationally uh, on the export market. Uh, and this is an opportunity that can make a huge difference to the industrialization, the reindustrialization of South Africa going forward, as well as to the just uh, transition towards a, a cleaner and decarbonized future. Um, so I'd now like to um, welcome our next uh, presenter. Uh, his name is Peter McKee. Sorry, Peter Mackey. Uh, Peter Mackey uh, is from um, Eliquid. Uh, he is the Vice President of Strategy and Policy Support for the Hydrogen Energy Business Line at Eliquid, based in Paris. Uh, prior to his appointment in 2020, he was located in Frankfurt, where he held a wide ranging role in Air Liquid's uh, strategy team, including uh, co-chairing uh, the group's energy transition task force. Before joining Air Liquid, uh, Peter spent over two decades working as a highly ranked equity analyst covering the European chemical sector, where he worked in London for several major financial institutions. Uh, so with that, uh, welcome to Peter Mackey. Uh, thanks for joining us, and we're really looking forward uh, to hearing about uh, what Air Liquid is doing and the technologies it possesses uh, to help um, Europe, to help South Africa uh, transition towards a decarbonized future. 
Over to you, Peter. Thank you very much, uh, Chris, and uh, uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm just going to try and uh, share my screen here, so hopefully this will uh, come through okay. Um, let's try that. Right, we are seeing it uh, well. Uh, that's great. Thanks, Peter. Well, I'm not sure. Is that uh, what are you seeing? The uh, my presentation screen. We right? are. We're seeing your presentation, Green Hydrogen for South Africa, by Peter um, Mackey. <laughs> fantastic, because that's completely different to what I can see at my end. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so hence the uh, the check. But thanks very much, and as I say, uh, uh, welcome. Good afternoon to everybody. Um, I propose just to uh, to start with a, a bit of a broad introduction on hydrogen and, and South Africa's, Africa's position, but I recognize that uh, I suspect some of my comments will uh, overlap a lot with previous speakers, so I'll, I'll go through that fairly quickly and then talk a little bit about um, our activities in hydrogen, uh, generally in hydrogen energy uh, and in South Africa, and of course, um, uh, I'll be around for uh, for the Q&A session a little bit later. So uh, let's just carry on. So um, you may or may not have seen uh, this slide or something similar to it uh, before. This is the IEA's uh, Energy Technology Perspectives chart on how to um, deliver the, the energy transition. There are other very similar ones. I've seen one very recently from, from McKinsey that looks uh, uh, very similar. What it really underlines is that there is no one answer there's no silver bullet to the um uh to uh, delivering the energy transition there are uh, many levers behind it um and the way we tend to summarize it is uh, uh as having four critical drivers the first and it's often uh, overlooked by a lot of people who are looking for technological solutions but the first is energy efficiency simply you know what we have is very valuable, so let's um, let's uh, not waste it uh, today. Uh, the second is obviously um, shifting power production to uh, to renewables uh, to deliver carbon-free electricity. The third is then obviously to convert existing um, uh, fossil-based energy vectors to those renewables. So through low-carbon emission car carriers, which uh, both electricity through uh, electrification as the, as the primary solution and also for hydrogen. And then the fourth driver for the particularly hard to abate uh, areas and uh, industries, as well as uh, I think many countries recognize as a transitionary process is through uh, uh, carbon capture and storage or, uh, or utilization. Um, Again, another slide you may have seen, which is just looking at the, um, the McKinsey Hydrogen Council reports roles uh, for hydrogen within the um, energy transition. And hydrogen plays a role uh, right the way throughout the supply chain. So in the upstream area, in both uh, integrating and in the long term, in balancing uh, the energy system, um, in and also in distributing uh, and transporting energy so this is not only geographically but also you could argue uh, over time as a, as a storage medium and and this is obviously particularly uh, of interest to uh, to south africa from the export potential and then hydrogen plays uh, an important role in decarbonizing the end uses end uses as well uh, so that is uh, alongside electrification uh, means to decarbonize transportation, uh, high uh, temperature energy use, um, industrial feedstock and uh, heating and power. So hydrogen plays a very varied role in this and uh, a lot of people have talked about, uh, I think Mon Monica talked about it before me and in the chat about the need for collaboration and it's quite clear that in this industry and industrial structure that collaboration is, uh, is essential. Um, this is a hydrogen council analysis of the timeline for hydrogen to be the cost competitive low carbon solution. So you, what you can see from this is that in 
uh, technologies that uh, hydrogen today is the, um, the solution. Uh, so industrial feedstock, uh, low carbon hydrogen clearly is, is today the, um, the, the cheapest low carbon alternative. You can see for other applications there, particularly in transport uh, and in um, uh, integration with heat and power for buildings, that in the most optimal regions, um, hydrogen is uh, the, the competitive solution, low carbon solution in the early to mid 2020s. And for the average application, as we're looking towards the back end of this decade and into the 2030s, hydrogen is the, you know, a competitive low carbon solution. Now, I keep emphasizing it's the low carbon solution. Um, hydrogen's adoption as an alternative to conventional and therefore emitting technologies, of course, is very much, in most cases, a function of policy support until we get significant uh, scale up cost reductions through the, uh, the hydrogen uh, industry. And that's what um, this slide uh, looks at. So uh, this is integral to that uh, scale up um, and competitiveness chart on the previous slide. Uh, it shows the timeline between 2020 and 2030. And over that period, uh, we, the Hydrogen Council, the hydrogen industry, uh, expect a 55 or 60% cost reduction for green hydrogen production in the average location. And here we're talking about uh, uh, Northern Europe. Um, clearly, South Africa uh, is much more close to the optimal case. So there we're talking about uh, 20, 30 costs that are not far off half the level that we're talking here. But the key, the scale of the reduction uh, is very much uh, very similar to the one that we talk about here. And the key drivers of it are essentially the, the same. It is very important to emphasize that this cost reduction is not simply a matter of time passing. Going from 2020 to 2030 doesn't deliver a 60% reduction in hydrogen costs. The drivers are massive scale up in the entire uh, industry related to green hydrogen. So particularly in um, electrolysis uh, manufacturing capacity. Um, and we talk here about uh, $1.6 dollars uh, per kilo reduction in the cost coming um, from the capex reduction that is that requires something like 90 gigawatts of electrolysis capacity to be deployed and that will require something like 60 to 70 billion dollars um, to be met in the form of policy support to fill that funding gap to get us to that level of scale up uh, the other thing that needs to scale up, of course, is renewable uh, power generating uh, capacity. Uh, Monica mentioned the, the cost of electricity being critical, is absolutely right, and the scale up of renewable capacity and low cost renewable uh, generation capacity is, is similarly critical to the, uh, the reduction in green hydrogen costs. Um, I think Again, Monica had a, a chart that was similar to this. Um, Mr. Constantinescu presented, uh, talked about men, uh, the development of the, uh, an international market. What you can see here is the regions of the world positioned by you know, their strength and positioning in different colors of hydrogen. And so it identifies some of the key exporting regions. Um, I saw a, a comment in the, uh, in the chat uh, talking about uh, Russia's position. Um, Russia and Canada are fairly strongly positioned in terms of the, in, in the potential for, uh, for blue hydrogen uh, export. And there are projects developing uh, for exports out of, uh, out of Russia in particular. And clearly um, Canada's uh, strategy has already talked about developing an export uh, business. Um, we know, uh, I mean, the, the big exporting regions or potential exporting regions for green hydrogen. South Africa, without a doubt, uh, is one of those, both for uh, with strength of um, uh, solar capacity, 
uh, and also around the coast for its, um, its uh, wind uh, position uh, and resources. Alongside South Africa, of course, there are other uh, Chile, Australia, North Africa developing uh, similar sort of uh, economics. And then you have other regions that are a big a mix of both. So the Middle East, uh, possibly the US and, uh, and so on. And we're seeing um, export projects, as I, I mentioned, Russia, but particularly developing in Australia and, uh, and the Middle East at the moment. Um, but as I emphasize, South Africa is very well positioned to be a potential exporter in that market as well. And again, Monica mentioned um, the different uh, energy vectors. Uh, we also look at uh, liquid hydrogen uh, against ammonia, against uh, the liquid organic hydrogen car carriers, LOHCs. Um, in our view, which one develops or which, uh, on which routes depends very much on the needs of the end market. If what you need, um, you know, particularly if what you need is a hydrogen molecule and especially a liquid hydrogen molecule in the destination market, then clearly uh, shipping it in the form of LH2 is the most attractive. Um, if you're looking for combustion purposes, then uh, ammonia looks uh, it, it is more competitive in that, in that environment. Um, and that, it's clear that uh, Europe and Asia will be uh, important import markets. Uh, Europe's indicated that it wants to import 40 gigawatts of, uh, of uh, hydrogen capacity by uh, a year by 2030. Um, in developing the international supply chain, it becomes critical to synchronize the export activity and the import off takers in order to uh, uh, optimize value of the entire uh, supply chain. And so again, this talks to collaboration and partnerships um, in this uh, in the hydrogen industry. Just to introduce a little bit about Air Liquide, um, we've been active in the hydrogen market for over 50 years uh, now and are present throughout the, uh, the industrial supply, um, supply chain. We operate close to 2000 kilometers of hydrogen pipeline and we sell 1.2 million tons of hydrogen uh, a year today. So about 2 billion euros of, uh, of revenues. Our traditional business, as you can imagine, is based on the traditional gray reforming technologies. But we do operate a number of very small electrolyzers today, and I'll, I'll come back to that uh, in, a, in a moment. It's worth mentioning that the majority of the hydrogen industry today is, um, uh, is a captive industry. It's produced by its, uh, by its users in the refining industry and, the, and uh, ammonia in particular. But in both cases, they tend to use that those are chemical feedstocks used primarily on site. Handling and distributing and transporting the, uh, the hydrogen molecule is a difficult thing to do. It's something that we've been doing, as I say, for, uh, uh, for over 50 years. Um, I mentioned that our existing business is, is grey hydrogen, of course, but we have a very clear uh, plan to decarbonize that as we shift to low carbon technologies. Uh, and we're looking at all the different uh, routes to deliver that, but from biomethane uh, to replace uh, natural gas as a feedstock, uh, through uh, electrolysis um, of low carbon electricity, CCUS uh, technologies, and also leveraging industrial byproducts. Um, so, and that is, of course, for you know, not only decarbonizing our existing markets, but also uh, to replace and develop new usages to replace uh, fossil fuels in new, uh, new growth areas. And this is just to, this slide is uh, intended to give you a bit of an idea of what we where we are active in the hydrogen energy world today. So I would argue that we're one of the most active players um, uh, today. We've invested uh, around half a billion euros so far uh, over the last five years in uh, different schemes um, throughout the supply chain. So initially in refueling stations. So we have uh, installed over 120 stations worldwide. We operate over 50 of those today. We have uh, founded a number of refueling networks in Europe, particularly in Germany, uh, in Asia, in 
Japan, Korea, and China, and in uh, different parts of the, uh, the US. We operate, uh, or we set up, and are a shareholder in the largest hydrogen taxi fleet, that's in Paris, um, where we operate over 600 taxis. Um, and we are developing projects to roll out uh, hydrogen heavy duty trucks. So again, uh, Monica mentioned the uh, 500 trucks in Port of Rotterdam, that's part of the um, or link to the high trucks project that we're developing with the Port of Rotterdam, with the Port of Antwerp and the Port of uh, Duisburg um, to, to put uh, around a thousand, at least a thousand trucks in total in the market by 2025. We're also currently uh, building the, the largest liquefier uh, for the specifically for the mobility markets uh, in the US on the West Coast that will uh, start up at the, uh, the, in the fourth quarter of this year. And we have another, a number of uh, industrial projects here. For instance, we, um, we have a project supplying ThyssenKrupp with hydrogen to develop hydrogen injection for uh, the blast firms. And I would say that um, investment goes beyond money. It goes into time and commitment as well. Uh, again, we've talked about collaborations, but you know, we uh, created the Hydrogen Council back in 2017 um, alongside uh, uh, Toyotas, and we are uh, co-chair of the Hydrogen Council today. And we are very active on a number of committees that are developing uh, regulations, norms, and standards to ensure that uh, actors in this market, as it develops, really meet the uh, essential um, safety criteria. I mentioned that I would touch on uh, electrolysis in particular. I think it's very important to do so. We, we do operate a number of very small electrolyzers um, and have done for many years um, where they have met, uh, have met uh, commercial requirements. But, uh, we've seen a very particular scale up over the last three years. So uh, in 2018, we brought um, a one and a bit megawatt demo plant on stream in Denmark for to demonstrate power to gas technology. Uh, in 2019, we bought a stake in Hydrogenics, which is a, a small, very leading, a leading manufacturer of PEM electro, uh, electrolyzers. Uh, in 2020, the, the end of last year, we brought on stream that what is today the world's largest PEM electrolyzer, a 20 megawatt electrolyzer in Beckenpool, Canada. So that's run from uh, renewable hydropower today and supplies uh, the local chemical industry as well as mobility markets. Um, and that momentum has really built uh, very much in, in recent weeks. So, so far in 2021, we've announced the H2B project in Normandy. So that's a up to 200 megawatt project to decarbonize industry in, uh, in northern France and contribute to mobility markets there. And just two days ago, we signed an MOU, we announced an MOU with, uh, with Siemens uh, to develop a partnership there on PEM electrolysis to really push the industrialized uh, scale up of uh, electrolysis manufacturing as well as focus on, on leading edge uh, R&D here. So you know, we're, we're really seeing momentum building, our momentum building in the uh, electrolyzer space. Uh, and finally, just to touch a little bit on, on Elikid's position in South Africa, we have been uh, present in the country for about 60 years. We operate um, uh, over 20 sites across the country. Um, our most significant uh, activity in, um, in South Africa has been as the, the principal partner for, for Sasol on the supply of air separation technology. Um, and to that effect, we announced, so we've, we've supplied equipment uh, historically. The most recent air separation unit, um, actually we operate and uh, under uh, contract. But uh, as of last year, we announced the eight and a half billion uh, RAND investment in and acquisition of all of Sasol's um, oxygen uh, trains, its air separation units. Uh, we will take, subject to competition authority approval, we'll take those, we'll take ownership of those assets and then work very closely with Sasol to significantly reduce the, uh, the CO2 emissions of the, um, 
uh, that business at the uh, the Secunda site. So, uh, and our intention is then to leverage this uh, this very significant place to bring uh, decarbonisation solutions to to South Africa. So, uh, with that, I'll wrap up and hand back to Chris. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Peter Mackey, for giving us some insights on what they're doing uh, in Europe, what they're doing in South Africa. Uh, and it's really startling uh, to see this uh, ramp up uh, of electrolyzer technology, these partnerships. And I think that was a key message uh, coming from your presentation, the need to collaborate and partner. Uh, South Africa can be a, an exporter, but it needs demand. Uh, and uh, if the two work together, if people like Port of Rotterdam help us with ports, uh, they have got ports uh, to, to, to import. Uh, they, we need help uh, developing our coastal ports for export. Uh, and I think these uh, partnerships between countries are, you know, are very significant. And it goes to the heart of what we're talking about today, the European Union South Africa Partnership for Growth Project program. Uh, so, uh, you know, that's embedded into the very nature of what we're talking about uh, today. So thank you, Peter, uh, for those insights. And it's now my great pleasure to welcome back an old friend of South Africa. Uh, I think he's got one foot in South Africa and one foot in Germany. Uh, oh, but uh, he's one of the people who I regard as one of the greatest thinkers in terms of energy in South Africa. And I'm so glad we haven't lost you uh, Tobias, uh, and, and welcome to the webinar today uh, from Germany, I guess, uh, in, the, in the COVID world that we live in. Uh, a little bit of background on Tobias. Uh, he is the director and CEO of Enetrag South Africa. So yeah, wonderful to know that you're active in the business of South Africa, developing new opportunities. Uh, he's also the head um, of the new energy solutions division at Enetrag in Germany. Before joining Enetrag uh, in September 2017, he successfully established and led the energy center at the CSIR, the same CSIR, the same energy center that has released this study today at this webinar. So really, uh, it's a privilege to have you here, uh, Tobias. Um, CSIR is South Africa's National Multidisciplinary Research Council. And under your leadership became the first port of call for decision makers on the South African energy transition. And we are looking to hydrogen to play a really important part in this uh, energy transition. And we're looking forward to hear what you have to say to us. Over to you, Tobias. Great, thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Chris, for the for the kind introduction and for inviting me for this webinar. I, I do hope that uh, at some point soon, as efficient as these webinars are, that we are able to meet in person again. Um, in in the back, what you see in the background is unfortunately not uh, Berlin, where I'm based at the moment. Uh, right now, uh, we have minus eight degrees, so um, I I feel for all the South African friends and colleagues uh, who are in in, in summer right now. Um, um, I'm, I'm very glad to, to see that the whole topic of hydrogen, where uh, I must say South Africa, uh, long long before the time also of the CSR Energy Center, put with a lot of foresight, put that topic on the uh, research and innovation agenda uh, through the HISA program, amongst uh, others. Uh, and I'm very glad to see that this is now reaping, uh, South Africa is now able to reap the benefits of that, because um, the topic in the last year alone has, uh, has picked up speed very substantially. I'm very uh, glad to, to uh, report about what we are doing as Enatrack on the green hydrogen side and what we see as the export opportunity for South Africa in that uh, space. First of all, uh, two, three slides about Enatrack as a company. We, we are the typical uh, German uh, mid-sized family owned, um, uh, 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 privately run uh, business uh, type of German Mittelstand um, with uh, 700 employees round about 300 million um, uh, turnover per year. Um, and our focus is exclusively around renewable energy. Uh, we come from the wind side, we do uh, solar as well in the last couple of years started with that. Uh, we have implemented about 1.6 gigawatt of renewables in the last uh, 25 years, um, raised 2 billion euro of debt and equity to implement that. And uh, our business is to, uh, to do project business, at, but uh, also keep assets on our own balance sheet. Um, we have around 750 megawatt on our own balance sheet and from that 
will produce uh, two terawatt hours of electricity per year. Uh, so um, a renewable power plant uh, utility basically, but one thing I would like to highlight on this uh, timeline is that uh, I'm, I think we, are, we can be uh, proudly say that we are um, uh, the, the first uh, commercial 100% um, green hydrogen operator in the world actually since 2011. Um, and purely green hydrogen based on, on wind uh, energy from a dedicated wind turbine that was purpose built to supply this electrolyzer plant. This electrolyzer plant, you see it here, it's in, in commercial operation since 2011. So we are um, having the first decade now of operations um, and uh, combined with one ton of hydrogen storage housed in this building, it's half a megawatt electrolyzer. Uh, at the time, super big. Um, now half a megawatt is not really, um, uh, that's, that's, that's smaller than one module of today's electrolyzers. Um, and of course, uh, today, if you build electrolyzers in this building, you will be able to host many, many megawatts of electrolyzer capacity. So you don't need the same footprint uh, anymore. But of course, what's, uh, what's of interest to us as a, as a renewable utility is the, the commercialization and the, uh, and the trading of the 50 tons of green hydrogen that we are producing here per year. And we know what, what premium you can achieve if you can say that the hydrogen is uh, directly uh, derived from this um, adjacent uh, wind turbine. It's uh, around about one, one hour north of Berlin, uh, next to our headquarters. We also on the mobility side, uh, very active on that side as well. Uh, with, with some of that hydrogen, small portions, of course, uh, of the 50 tons are fueling our two hydrogen fuel cell vehicles that we have at the moment. We are, we've just uh, passed a strategy to electrify our entire uh, transport fleet of around 130 cars, uh, transport, small transport cars and passenger cars to battery electric roughly 80% and 20% will go to fuel cell. At the moment, we have two and uh, one Toyota and one uh, Hyundai Nexo in day-to-day -day use. Then I would also like to report on um, a very interesting project that we have just, um, uh, just concluded and submitted for EU. Uh, it fits very nicely into this context today. It has been submitted to EU Green Deal funding in, in January. Um, I, I can't mention the industry consortium members uh, here yet because we are just yet to go out uh, publicly um, with, a, with a marketing campaign around it, but I can share some, some key cornerstones with that already. Um, it's, a, it's a project around a cement plant in Germany. Um, that cement plant emits around 1 million tons of CO2 per year. Um, we've talked about the CO2 emissions from cement and I saw some comments in the chat uh, saying that, well, cement CO2 emissions are kind of like fossil, which is, of course, true because they are not from a closed cycle, but they come from the process. Um, however, a cement plant needs lots of heat as well. And the heat at this cement plant already is largely supplied by biomass or by biogenic origin, either bio-based or, or biomass, um, which means roughly 25% of the total CO2 emissions of that cement plant, that's similar to other cement plants as well, are actually of biogenic origin and 75% are process related. Now with this pilot plant that we have, uh, uh, that we are busy developing and that we have submitted under an Enertrack led industry consortium for this EU Green Deal funding, um, we aim to produce 5,000 tons of fuels out of these two uh, CO2 streams by deploying a 20 megawatt electrolyzer that will produce 2,000 tons of hydrogen per year, reverse water gas shift reactor and uh, fissure tropsch reactor. Um, we need for that roughly 30 megawatt wind and 30 megawatt solar PV from regional electricity. Uh, they must be additional because otherwise it's effectively coal power that you feed in here. So that's always a key criterion from a sustainability perspective. Um, and then we, are, uh, we, are, we will be producing um, uh, around 25% uh, of that CO2 will be converted into sustainable aviation fuel because that's a closed cycle going back to the carbon where the biomass um, is growing. And the other 75%, there's something to do with that as well, actually, if you feed it into the chemicals sector of NAFTA, for example, if, it, if you feed it into chemicals that are not used for energetic purposes, which means they are not burned and they will never become CO2 uh, eventually, then you have a permanent capture of CO2 and you still have something useful to do with it. So you have an, an opportunity for the cement plant to store away the CO2 permanently um, without having this, to store the CO2 as a gas, it becomes quite tricky and, uh, um, and there are also limitations in terms of uh, cavern space, but you can effectively store it away as a chemical, much easier to store, obviously. Um, COD planned for this one here in 24, 25. Um, and we are currently preparing that for, for upscaling to go 10 times bigger, 200 megawatt electrolyzer, 
um, for for potential uh, further um, uh, grant funding submission in the EU schemes that, that we heard before. Um, Last sentence on Enatrack in South Africa, proudly South African team, highly skilled, motivated, around 20 people, um, uh, still growing. We are developing our bread and butter business, two gigawatt pipeline of wind and solar PV. And we have lots of innovation projects around, around either hybridization of wind and solar or and or hydrogen under development in South Africa as well, with offices in, in Gauteng and Cape Town. With that, um, to the topic of hydrogen first as a, as a general uh, thought and then the, uh, the the opportunity for South Africa here. Um, uh, not, not much new, just a slightly different angle to what we heard from uh, many of the other speakers already. Uh, I just wanted to, to bring one point home, um, which is that we, when we look at the future energy system, we see solar, wind and hydrogen, these three components are basically forming the future energy system. And solar and wind, of course, hydro wherever possible, but solar and wind are really the bulk primary energy sources in the future. We are essentially turning uh, upside down the energy flow chart uh, where, where electricity comes at the very end as an end user form of energy. But now electricity from sun and wind, as variable as it is, is basically the primary energy in the future. Um, and we either use that primary energy, that electricity directly, or we use it through electrolysis in form of hydrogen. And whether we do that or not depends in our view on whether we are able to use the electricity directly or not. So wherever we can use electricity directly from solar and wind, gonna do that because the efficiency of that pass is by far superior. If we have to recycle the electricity because wind and sun is variable, but we need it in a different uh, time scale, uh, 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 timing, then we recycle the electricity, uh, the raw electricity through batteries. If that's not possible anymore for seasonality reasons or for, for other reasons, maybe we don't need electricity, we need, we need chemicals, for example, then we can go the green hydrogen route. If green hydrogen doesn't work for whatever reason, maybe we need ammonia in fertilizer production, for example, we add nitrogen and get green ammonia. And last but not least, but from an efficiency perspective, probably the, the last option that we want to choose is to add a carbon atom to the hydrogen atom to get two hydrocarbons the only way, uh, space where we see a place for that because of the low efficiency of the path efficiency is um, uh, for aviation fuel. Um, and then if we look at the end use sector, um, where are these energy carriers then used? Well, uh, direct electric who uh, use uh, heating, transport, battery, of course, in transport for small trucks and for cars, hydrogen, steel making, potentially for heating and re-electrification through fuel cells, green ammonia in fertilizer and as a shipping fuel. And then the kerosene is the aviation fuel. And with that, we basically have captured more or less the entire energy system. Of course, there are not every sector as mentioned here, but I think in principle, that's the, that's the bulk of, of all the end use sectors that we need to supply at the end of the day. Um, if we focus on the hydrogen, that means if we convert the entire global energy system from that perspective, we will need roughly 500 to 600 million tons uh, per year of, of hydrogen. That is not, not uh, factoring in the growth of the energy system yet. It's purely if we take today's system and, and, and flip it. So five to 600 million tons per year. That number is important because I want to make a link to the tradable products. You see that some of this, in some of these cases here, we need the hydrogen in its pure form as pure hydrogen. Now we heard that from, from other speakers before that to transport pure hydrogen over long distances is not not easy, and we will very likely not, not do that. Um, so, um, so the focus then is on hydrogen rich products that are easy tradable. And if we look at five to 600 million tons per year of total green hydrogen demand, if we now look at how much of that do we actually need uh, without a transport logic, how much of that do we need in products that are in the end transportable? It's 320 million tons of that. So much more than 50% of that is actually going into products anyway that are tradable. So I think that answers the question of whether, whether green hydrogen itself uh, will be traded, very likely not. Yeah? You will rather produce the green hydrogen that you need as trade hydrogen yourself domestically, maybe through pipelines from neighboring countries, but not global trade. And then these main three product categories will stand for the global trading. So. Green ammonia, mentioned it before, you take the hydrogen, you add nitrogen, gives you NH3. 
a highly tradable product being traded today already, today already used for fertilizer production, global demand around about 170 million tons per year. 30, that means 30 million hydrogen demand, but much bigger demand, we can use it for shipping fuel as well. One of the rather straightforward ways to decarbonize the large seaborne um, tr uh, transport industry, but not, not so easy to, to uh, decarbonize uh, shipping uh, in, by any other means. Uh, that would be another 90 million tons of hydrogen demand. If we add carbon, we get to kerosene aviation fuel. There, there we have a global uh, demand of 400 million tons that stands for a hydrogen demand of 100 million tons per year. And then we have the green steel. So if we add hydrogen to um, iron oxide and reduce the iron with the help of hydrogen instead of coal, then we need another 100 million tons of hydrogen per year. So all these products, highly tradable, 320 million tons of, uh, of green hydrogen demand per year from these four sectors alone. Um, and now the link to South Africa. Um, it, it, I, I see green hydrogen as the link to, to, uh, to, to help South Africa to effectively beneficiate South African wind and sun. That's maybe something that is a bit unusual to use that term. With beneficiation, we usually mean the stuff and the things that are from underground, from mining. And that, of course, will remain. And uh, renewable actually can help to, uh, to make that a competitive industry uh, or to keep it a competitive industry. Um, but, but we usually don't think of above ground harvested resources when we talk beneficiation. I think the exact same logic applies. It's a beneficiation of a raw material, which is wind and sun, and that can be beneficiated and, and uh, converted into exportable products. If you look at these products again, and now put a price tag to it in terms of what could be the market potential for South Africa, I roughly estimated that the market potential could be 150 billion euro of export potential for South Africa in the long run per year. To put that into perspective, the South African GDP today is 300 billion euro roundabout. Yeah, so it's very, very significant. How do I get to that number? Everybody can make his own, uh, his or her own assumption. Um, I just look at fertilizer, uh, global value of green fertilizer. So not just the hydrogen, but the entire fertilizer, roughly 50 billion euro per year. If South Africa aims for a 10% market share because it has this pristine position of um, uh, lots of wind, lots of sun, makes 5 billion. Uh, shipping fuel, again, 10% market share for South Africa makes 25 billion. 10% market share in the aviation fuel makes another 50 billion. And 5%, I, I was a bit more conservative on the steel side, 5% market share on the steel side makes another 75 billion. That makes 150 billion uh, hydrogen-based export potential for South Africa. Very significant. Um, in order to achieve that, uh, we need a lot of uh, sun and wind and electrolyzers. And I just wanted to show what that would mean for the energy system in South Africa. Um, if we look at the South African electricity sector alone, yeah, then and we assume five gigawatt of wind, five gigawatt of solar, then that's roughly a typical week of electricity demand, wind and solar supply, and in grey you see the residual electricity demand that is not not wind and sun supplied. Yeah? Um, if we look at still electricity sector alone, if we optimize the electricity sector, then we need roughly fifty gigawatt of sun, another fifty gigawatt of wind. We will have times of uh, surplus, which is curtailed, um, uh, because it makes economic sense to curtail it in order to get a lot of blue and yellow above the, the line. But that is a very electric, electrical load only, without sector coupling, without hydrogen production. If we produce hydrogen, then of course, whatever goes below the zero line is not curtailed anymore. But whatever goes below that line will first feed into electrolyzers. It goes in the electrolyzers first because we want high load factors with the electrolyzers. That's why we take this part of the surplus first into electrolyzers. And the latter part is then going into something like uh, direct electric heat production. And only the very last band goes into curtailment. With 45 gigawatt of electrolyzers, that's how it would look like. But if we want to reap this market benefits that I mentioned before, this 150 billion euro export potential, we would need 200 to 250 gigawatt of electrolyzer. And that's how it would look like then. And you can see that suddenly the entire South African electricity demand here on the top becomes almost a side effect of the export um, uh, production uh, market of green hydrogen products. So it's a little bit like Saudi Arabia, where um, uh, the oil market in Saudi Arabia itself is to supply Saudi Arabian oil demand 
is kind of a, a side product of uh, the general oil production capacity of that country. And to some extent, it would be similar in the South African case if really this 300 gigawatt wind and solar 250 gigawatt electrizer were, were deployed. Um, what, what does that mean? I want to make the last link to employment and job creation. Yeah? If we look at uh, this long-term picture, 300 gigawatt of wind, 300 gigawatt of solar PV, because the bulk of that would go into an export market through green hydrogen and hydrogen-based products. Uh, if we need that, let's say by 2050, that means we need to build roughly 12 to 14 gigawatt of new wind and new solar PV, not just in one year, not just in two years, but in perpetuity. Yeah, because once you have uh, once you have built the 300 gigawatt, then uh, basically after 25, 30 year lifetime, 10 gigawatt have to be replaced and you continuously build 12 to 14 gigawatt of new wind and new solar PV every single year in perpetuity. Um, then uh, that would mean if you have such a build program, that's 25 gigawatt of new power generating capacity built each and every year. Um, to operate that and to build that in the wind and solar uh, uh, value chain alone, you need more than half a million of permanent jobs in the build out of that solar and wind sector. That's with, without the electrolyzers, without building the electrolyzers, without operating the electrolyzers, and of course, without any trading activity linked to the green hydrogen. Purely the, the backbone of all of this, the wind and the solar capacity. Um, and then we would have 25 to 30 million tons of green hydrogen based uh, exports, which would lead, that's the link to the 150 billion euro export potential from the beginning. So the renewable sector to me is a huge opportunity for South Africa to reindustrialize with these numbers that you've seen there. Uh, in my opinion, the speed of the energy transition in South Africa will not be driven by costs nor by technology availability anymore because both top boxes have long been ticked actually. Uh, we are beyond that, that point. But in my opinion, the speed of the transition of the energy transition will be driven by our ability to address the structural change in the existing industries and the existing industrial regions and industrial clusters um, that are affected by that transition and sometimes negatively affected and to provide a meaningful future for them. Um, and it will be driven by our ability in the South African context specifically to reindustrialize South Africa on the back of a fully transformed renewable sector. And renewables sector to me goes way beyond solar and wind, as you can see from this link to the hydrogen in the other sectors. Green hydrogen based on solar and wind gives an opportunity to bring some of the benefits of the energy transition into the existing industrial regions, such regions as the coal regions, cement regions, steel, old mining uh, areas, and create a competitive export article, article for South Africa for, uh, to reindustrialize the country. And as such, the renewable sector to me is much broader than solar PV and wind electricity. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's a very exciting opportunity for South Africa. And we as Enatrack are extremely uh, uh, glad to be part of that transition and to, uh, to uh, uh, walk with South Africa in the next decades to come. Thank you very much for your attention. Wow. Well, I'm kind of blown away. Um, and it's clear that we need people with big visions uh, because there are big opportunities. Uh, and you know, South Africa was in fact built with people with big visions uh, some, you know, in those days. Uh, people like Funder Bale, uh, who, who, who had a vision of the industrialization of South Africa. Uh, and, and it was a big vision that people like him had. Uh, and I think, Tobias, you've given us a, a hint of what such a big vision could be for South Africa if we have the metal to grasp this and to appreciate it and to not be distracted by a whole lot of naysayers who uh, cast doubt in everybody's mind. Uh, but uh, I think people like yourself who understand energy and its fundamentals and understand the opportunity and what this could mean for South Africa. And you know, we have to be aggressive. If we don't seize this opportunity, other countries uh, like Australia who have quite a record for go for it uh, and the ability to deliver on time and on budget, 
really hard-nosed types. <laughs> uh, this is what we're up against, uh, but we have got advantages and we are innovative people. Uh, and, and I think we have got what it takes if we set our mind to it and are inspired by visionary leaders. And I hope uh, today that uh, Minister Nzamandi has uh, grasped and understood, as I think he does uh, clearly from his presentation, uh, you know what this means, but maybe not to the to to to, to the vision that you have for the sector uh, as as what this could do for South Africa by 2050 uh, if we were to grasp this um, opportunity. So thank you very much for for your presentation, ladies and gentlemen. It's now 10 to five. There are more than 200 questions on the chat program. We've had at peak uh, about a thousand people uh, participating in this webinar. There has been massive interest. And I wanna say that this is not the end of the hydrogen discussions, but just the beginning as Tobias has inspired us. Uh, so uh, we are planning uh, the hydrogen webinar number, number two and the hydrogen webinar number three already. Uh, and, uh, and to do the subject justice, we need more time to explore these things. I think we've been over ambitious in trying to cover so much today. Uh, and we have covered a lot. Uh, we've had incredible presenters, but there's all these questions, all these questions that need to be dealt with. And I'm afraid it's now 10 to five. And I don't think we're gonna deal with them uh, today. Uh, but I would like to assure people that we are going to deal with these questions uh, because they do need answers. So I'm going to kind of have to unfortunately draw this webinar uh, to a premature end today, but not uh, an end in the broader scheme of things. Uh, and I, I, it's my really um, pleasant duty uh, to ask um, a colleague, a uh, friend, a, a company who has traveled with us at EE Business Intelligence, Nedbank, uh, over the last two, three years in, um, in really exploring uh, and opening these dialogues up uh, to diverse input, uh, to challenging discussions uh, where we are really challenged to think for a change, really think about our energy future. And so I'm gonna ask um, uh, Tiago Almeida to sum up and I may, may I apologize that we have not been able to deal with all your questions, not by a long shot, uh, but we're not running away from these questions, we're going to deal with them. So uh, Tiago, uh, just to let you know, he's the sector lead for power and infrastructure at Nedbank CIB. Uh, he has very wide experience across Europe North and South America, the Middle East, Asia, and Africa in water, power, and industrial infrastructure ventures and utilities. Before joining Nedbank uh, in July uh, 2020, that was not long ago, he held a number of senior consulting positions um, and advisory positions at Mott McDonald. And really, it's an honor and a pleasure for me to hand over to Tiago and ask him to perhaps give some insights that he has taken away from, from this uh, webinar. I'm left quite blown away, uh, but I think it's important that we have somebody with a bit more neutral mind than mine uh, to perhaps sum up and also to offer a vote of thanks to all those that have been involved today uh, and to officially close this webinar. So, uh, Tiago, over to you for your comments and closure. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, well, I, you're not the only one that's blown away by the quality of the presentations. I think it's just been incredible. And, and this, this final one by, by, by Tobias has just blown, I think, all of us uh, out of the water. We, I'm very passionate about the topic and it's, uh, it's a great opportunity to, to, and an honor to, to be able to close the session. I think it's been a brilliant session um, the, it's an exciting time for South Africa. I think when we, when we look at it from, from so many different angles, the role that South Africa can play in the global green energy, uh, green hydrogen uh, economy, and make the most of its uh, renewable energy resources, make the most of the, the new global energy flows that are being established 
and the need for green-based products that um, they are going to inundate the, the market very soon. This is a, you know, this is a once in a lifetime opportunity for us and, and, and for the market. And, I, and, um, and certainly I'm very excited about that. And I, and I think from, from, from seeing how many people have attended the session and, and the quality of the presentations, I'm not the only one that's excited. Um, I think the, the message uh, is, is very clear and is a imp very important one. You know, the, the opportunities that we have to leverage off our renewable energy uh, resources and to develop on top of that, uh, invest in the, in the infrastructure that's required, not just to produce this energy in-house, but also to export this energy in these products is clear. Uh, it's also, I think, very clear and the, about the need to develop a strong legal and regulatory framework, which is something that um, is, is so fundamental to, to support all this investment and, and, and all the, the research that's needed in country to, to move this forward. Um, I, I think it's important to hear what, for, what was very important to hear about some of our colleagues from the European Union and, and institutions based in, in the EU about what it is that they're doing and how the, the hydrogen economy is already a reality uh, in Europe and in so many places in the world, because it allows us in South Africa the opportunity to learn, to innovate and, and really to join this, uh, this journey, which is, which is an incredible one. At NetBank, um, we, we are a key player in the South African uh, energy markets. Uh, we've funded and supported more, more renewable projects than any other bank. And this subject of green hydrogen is one that's top of mind for us, uh, especially given you know, our, our exposure to the solar and the, and the wind markets and, and the, the hunger that we have for green projects. So um, you know, not, not wanting to, to extend this any longer, um, I'd like to thank very much uh, Dr. Rina Kionka, the U, uh, European Union Ambassador to South Africa, um, his uh, honorable blade uh, Zimande, the, the Minister for Higher Education, Science and Innovation, and a special and massive thank you to all our presenters who have done an incredible job, uh, not just telling us about what it is that they are currently doing, but also what is possible and, and where are we going with all this, which I think has set the tone to, to how we're going to, to see the next few years and, and the energy transition, the just transition as well taking place in, in South Africa and across the world. Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, thank you, uh, Tiago, and uh, farewell to all our visitors. Uh, thank you for joining us. And we look forward to seeing you at the next webinar, which I think will be taking place certainly within the next six weeks. Uh, so keep your eyes open uh, for the announcements. Uh, and uh, we're going to have to answer all these questions. So bear with us and uh, join us for the next webinar. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much.